thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to um, this evening's uh, Development Control North, uh, which we will be starting straight away. So I'll start off with the first item on the agenda as apologies for absence. And I know we do have a few. Yeah, so we've received apologies from councillors Peter Burgess and Tricia Utan. And that, that's it. That's it, yes. Thank you. Minutes of the last meeting. Um, can I take those as being ready to sign at the appropriate time? Does anybody have any queries? Uh, yes, Councillor Karen Burgess. Sorry, I was just giving you the thumbs up as I was muted to say, yes, they're fine. <laughs> oh, fine. All right. Yeah, so you all agree the, the minutes of the last meeting? That's fine. Thank you very much. Are there any declarations of interest from any members? It doesn't. Oh, wait a minute. Councillor Claire Vickers. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, on item um, um, seven, uh, Kings Mill. Uh, Shipley Windmill. Um, I'm a past trustee of the mill from 2000, um, from 1992 to 2003, but currently I'm not, so I don't have an interest at the moment, but I just thought I'd declare that. Thank you. Right, thank you for that. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Right. Um, are there any announcements? I don't have any. Does... Um... I have um, some procedural announcement, yes, a very short one this time, Chairman. Good. <laughs> right when you're ready. Thank you. You're muted, Linda. I, sorry about that. Um, members are familiar now with the procedures and they know to keep their mobile phones switched to silent and that they remain live on YouTube just before and after the meeting. And there's just a few other points now to highlight. Um, some members of the public and the parish councils will be making representations by video recording, and they will be held in a waiting room by the host until it is their turn to speak. And if a member of the committee has an interest where they cannot speak or vote, the host will put them in the waiting area and then return them to the meeting at the end of the item. Uh, if members of the committee wish to participate in the discussion, please press the blue raise hand icon in the Zoom bar to indicate that you wish to speak and keep your microphone on mute until it is your turn. When the votes are taken by roll call, members need to be ready to unmute just before their name is called out and to mute themselves again afterwards. If you lose connection, you can re-enter the meeting via Zoom, but members will not be able to vote on any items that they have missed. So please abstain. And that's all the announcement pending. That's Thank it. you. Thank um, you. Did you have any announcements or are we all clear on that? No, right. In that case, we'll move straight on to um, agenda item five, which is appeals, which are really for noting, unless any member has any comment they want to make. Uh, in that case, we move straight on to um, item six, for which we have seven speakers um, that will come in at the end. But if we can have the presentation first, please. Good evening, members. I'll just bring up the presentation screen. There we go. So this application site comprises the Smith and Western restaurant and adjoining car park located at the junction of North Parade and West Parade in Horsham. This is the site as existing. This is Tulip Court, which sits opposite site to the south. And this is the Launcy Court that sits opposite to the east. The application seeks to replace the restaurant with a building comprising 22 flats. This is the proposed site layout, retaining the existing car park at the rear of the site. These are the ground and first floor plans, and these are the second and third floor plans. These are the proposed elevations. 
The building would be completed in brick with a zinc mansard roof. This image shows the indicative materials palette. The applicant has provided visuals to help explain their design approach and the scale of the massing of the building in its context. This is the first viewpoint from the Wimblehurst Road Junction. Note this visual does not include the two trees that are to be retained that would soften and screen the building on its southern elevation. This is the second viewpoint from the same junction, but showing its relationship with Tulip Court. And this is the third viewpoint looking south along North Parade. The proposed building has sought to reflect the characteristics of the buildings that sit opposite, using red brick, projecting bay elements, and a pitched roof. Given the varied architectural character of the area, the proposal is recommended for approval, subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you. As I said, we have seven speakers on this. The first one is John Hesch, um, who's speaking on video. When you're ready. There seems to be a technical issue. Just bear with me. I'll have to close and open the folder again. I beg your pardon. I'll try now. I'm not sure what happened then. I'll do it now. My name is John Hesch. I live on West Parade. I object to the plan for the following reasons. One, the increase in overlooking invasion of privacy has not been achieved, particularly as the terrace and external balconies continue to overlook West Parade. Will a loss of privacy to the residents of Tulip Court, the Walnuts and West Parade, all will be adversely affected. Surely the provision of Juliet balconies as found on Tulip Court will reduce the overlooking of residents. Two, the monolithic slab-ended building dominates West Parade with a canyon-like entrance to smaller residential properties. Stepping back West Parade elevation will soften this dominance whilst improving sight lines, views, and light to neighbors. Clearly stepping back the elevation will reduce the density and number of flats, but so doing will contribute significantly to the neighborhood ambience. This must be a critical factor and not just a repeat of other local flat designs to maximize density. Three, on-site parking proposals are a ruse to give the appearance that parking has been sorted and meet planning guidelines. The provision of tandem spaces for off West Parade is a stretch of these rules and should as such be rejected. In summary, I would urge the committee to modify the approval to take into consideration these proposals that directly affect residents adversely. Have any of the committee who will make the planning decision stood in West Parade and imagine the great imposition this building will cast over those who live here? Please support the people of West Parade. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is also on video. Um, Ray Hearn.
Hi, I live at Wonder Walnuts next door to the Smith & Western restaurant. I'm updating to some of the designs of the new plans of the apartments next door. Um, like many, I feel it's too big. Um, it could overshadow a lot of the walnuts whilst also offering invasion of privacy to the walnuts, the residents of Tulip Court and West Parade. Uh, from the visualisations, it does look very dominating to the entrance of West Parade. Um, with the visualisations, why are there no images of what it would look like from the West Parade angle? I can't see how it's going to look like against my house um, and how much it could overshadow my garden. Um, I can see from the new plans that the windows overlooking our garden have been moved to side windows, which I do appreciate. But what happens if the building is not built to those exact plans and those windows are moved? Um, on the original plans, there was balconies overlooking our garden. Um, they have been removed, and rightly so. But there are still balconies facing Tulip Court. And I do stand by other residents saying that they should be moved, made into Juliet balconies. We are not in the Canary Islands. People are not going to be sitting on balconies drinking pina coladas overlooking North Parade traffic lights. I do worry about dust and debris from the construction coming over to my house and garden. Uh, my baby is in the garden a lot during the good weather. I accept that these flats will go up at some point, um, but at the end of the day, this is just a business deal for the owners. So it does have to be right for everyone because these are our house and our lives it will affect. Thank you. Right, next we have Ron Bates, who's on Zoom. Good evening, Ron, I can speak to you. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Ron Bates and I'm speaking on behalf of the Horsham Society. The Horsham Society objects to the Smith & Western planning application. This application fails on a number of relevant planning considerations. One, the design and appearance is not in harmony with the existing adjacent buildings. The proposed structure is forward of the existing building line and too close to North Parade. It is too dominant for this gateway into Horsham. The height of the proposed building is excessive, being four storeys where all other apartment buildings in the area are three storeys. The design and access statement claims that the building takes precedent from local build forms and vernacular. There is no connection, there is no precedent. The visualisation perspectives show the proposed building as being smaller than it will actually be. Two. The proposed loss of trees. The application form claims there are no trees on the site. Contrary to this, the HTC Arbicultural Report identifies a mature silver birch and a field maple and says it appears that these can be readily retained. Please let this happen. Three, overshadowing and loss of privacy. This does occur despite statements that the proposed building has been sensitively designed. The proposed development overlooks and overshadows adjacent properties. This is clearly a loss of privacy privacy and neighboring to the neighboring residents. Four, parking spaces provided add up to 28 for the proposed 22 apartments containing 37 double bedrooms. Four of these car spaces have been located in West Parade, a narrow one-way road. The front two car spaces block the rear two car spaces. There is insufficient on-site parking and no nearby street parking. We ask get this out planning application be rejected for the relevant planning considerations given. Overall, the ap this application is too many apartments for the size of the site. It is over development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and next, next we have James Simpson, who is also on Zoom. So good evening, James. Oh, good, e good evening. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak um, in favour of this application. I'm James Simpson, a director and an architect at RDJW. We are pleased to have been able to work with our client and the planning officer on this scheme in a collaborative manner. The proposals provide an opportunity to provide a gateway and a landmark building to this area of Horsham, producing what we believe is a suitable but a distinctive design worthy of Horsham District Council's support. As you've seen from the images, we aim to achieve a development which would sit comfortably on the site by addressing the street and its co corner location in a positive manner. The corner element of the proposal, which faces North and West parades, represents the highest point and focus of the design. As the eye moves across the building from the corner, we have streamlined the elevations using the same materials, but reducing the height. 
We have also introduced a break and a step in the elevation to North Parade, which acts as circulation space. With no specific overriding vernacular, we have drawn upon a temp contemporary aesthetic, complemented by a palette of materials which are respectful of the surroundings. This can be seen with the introduction of mixed and feature bricks, as can be found on the property at the corner of Hurst Road and Pinehurst. In terms of the residential accommodation proposed, the apartment sizes all accord with national space standards to provide a generous layout, good levels of natural light outlook and aspect for future residents. This cannot be said for some permitted development schemes, which I'm sure you've seen in recent years. I would wholeheartedly support the officer's recommendation to approve this application, and I would urge members to do the same. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, and the next speaker is Peter Rainier, who is also on Zoom. So good evening to you. Good evening. When you're ready. Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Rainier from DMH Stallard, um, Director of Planning there. Uh, and we too have been uh, encouraged by the ability to talk, talk with and negotiate with your officers to what is now a very acceptable and appropriate scheme. We've also had significant consultation with neighbouring residents, including those that you've seen earlier. I want to boil down the issue into seven key planning points. Firstly, the principle of residential development is acceptable. It accords with the MPPF and importantly accords with your Horsham district planning framework. The aspirations are to maximise the use of brownfield sites, making the best use of sustainable urban locations such as this, and therefore minimising the need for greenfield release. The scheme helps to address the housing need by providing small dwellings and a financial contribution towards affordable units. The proposal is located on a site currently used as a restaurant, the relocation of which to the town centre has already been approved, Thus, the facility and the employment will not be lost to the town. The surrounding context provides a setting much better suited to residential development than a non-conforming food and beverage use. And of course, if the site is not redeveloped for housing, a drive through restaurant or similar could potentially utilise the site. The redevelopment of the site brings significant benefits to the local amenity. There will be reduced traffic generation Surveys show up to 800 cars visiting the site uh, previously to the, uh, to the pandemic every week. There'll be a significant reduction in parking demand, both on-site and off-site. There'll be reduced impact from, from cooking odours, reduced noise pollution, and an improved environment, particularly at the weekend and in the evenings. The site's close to Horsham Station in a sustainable location where car ownership is not critical to reach services and workplaces, and the risk um, of off-site off parking is limited. The scheme provides cycle parking and vehicle electric charging points. Finally, as your officer concludes, the character of the proposed development sits appropriately within the context of the wider and immediate surroundings in terms of the proposed scale and density, particularly when compared with adjacent flats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have um, Troy Cox, who's on video for the next one, the next speaker. Hi, good evening. My name is Troy Cox, a director of Smith & Weston's family business. We have been in the area at North Parade here for 25 years, part of the community. When we first arrived here then, uh, there wasn't many restaurants in the town. Uh, now as the town has developed, there are many. Uh, competition is very tough at the moment and feel for the best interests of the business will be to move into East Street in Horsham where the footfall would be more, parking um, is better, and local transport. The business will 
operate with a breakfast, lunch, dinner and a coffee shop. And this would create more jobs than the existing site with 60 new jobs, 30 full time and 30 part time. Since arriving 25 years ago at North Parade, we have seen the area develop hugely. When we came, there was a private house on each corner and over the years we have seen them develop into apartments, flats and retirement homes. Over the last few years or so we have been considering what we should do with the existing site here and felt that the best option will be for the area in the community to develop it into apartments. We have had various offers from hospitality companies, pubcos, restaurants and takeaways. Um, one development company of GCW were very interested in making it a drive-through. Um, but after the best interests of the area, felt it would be best to be uh, apartments. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. It does seem funny talking into space. Um, and the final speaker on this is Councillor Ben Peterson. Trafalgar Neighbourhood Council and um, Councillor Ben, you're, you're on Zoom, so I can say good evening to you. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Horsham Trafalgar Neighbourhood Council has consulted with the residents extensively uh, from West Parade, Tulip Court, Wimblehurst Road and White Hart Court. And we'd like to reiterate that we don't have any blanket objection to developing this area as flats. No one does. I think every resident I've spoken to agrees it will inevitably happen. But I think there is a strong belief that the process has been insensitive to the residents' um, realities and that the proposal represents an overdevelopment. In particular, while we do realise that the revisions of the proposal, which have been frequent over the last year and a half, have gone some way to alleviating the original problems, we feel the following issues remain. First, the development will put stress on a parking situation which is already very challenging in this road. Our West Parade is frequently completely full of cars. Newlands Road is overspill for West Parade. West Parade in turn is overspill sometimes for Wimblehurst Road and, and, and White Hart. It's a very stressful parking situation. Um, we understand that in the last revision, four places were added to the proposal. But those four parking places were added by creating tandem parking in an intensely convenient location. And the fact that they have to do that to reach a reasonable level of parking spaces, I think just underlines the fact that this proposal is an overdevelopment. Secondly, the proposal will involve a loss of privacy and overshadowing for the residents. This is a particularly important point for the end of West Parade, the Walnuts and Tulip Court. Uh, the new building will be higher than any of the buildings in the area so far. It will overlook the gardens of houses in, in the Walnuts and at the east end of West Parade it will look straight into Tulip Court. Original designs had enormous balconies and terraces, which would have had a grandstand view of everyone's garden. That's now been mitigated. But again, the difficulty that they've had in mitigating it does emphasize the fact that this is to a degree over development. So two balconies were removed in the last iteration of the proposals, which leaves two French windows kind of gaping into space and an extremely strange lopsided design at the end. The residents are aware that those changes were made and they understand that, you know, a process to work toward a satisfactory outcome is in progress. But the fact that it produces such a strange result to remove those balconies, I think, also further underlines the fact that this building is just too big for the location that it's planned to be built in. Um, and the, th the third objection, I guess, is that it's out of character for the area. Uh, the building has a, a monolithic box-like character puts an enormous mass right on the corner of North Parade and West Parade, which is a tricky corner as it is. Uh, the building has vertical sides going up higher than anything else in the area. No pitched roof, no, no meaningful amount of pitched roof, no setback, no decoration. It is essentially a box and the first such building in the area to be a pure box. Every other building that's appeared on the corner of this intersection over the years has either been set back behind trees and bushes or has had a pitched roof, Juliet balcony such as Tulip Court. This is our first sort of uh, South Bank of the Thames style development and there's very little verge and it will considerably obstruct light and views down the road. We also feel, to be honest, that if the taller part of the building were off the corner that would mitigate this problem to some degree. So right now the building has a tall end and a short end. I think residents are surprised that the tall end of the building is 
four floors of plate glass windows uh, looking across houses and gardens and it would be possible to move that more onto, onto North Parade. That's really the summary of the residents' feelings. Uh, I think we've heard from two residents uh, in this co consultation, but as you know, many, many more residents have written eloquently on the subject and many more beyond that have expressed eloquent um, opinions to me of, about the, the impact on themselves. I would add one more thing though, which is that documents submitted with the application have generally tried to give the impression that this is happening in an already built up area with already moderately high rise buildings. The original application, for example, contained no references to any of the houses that make up the great majority of Trafalgar, but did include a photograph of the YMCA building from down in the town centre, which doesn't seem very ingenuous. I think residents would have appreciated perhaps more engagement uh, and a more direct sort of um, acceptance of the current state of the Trafalgar neighbourhood, which is you know, small houses, essentially. For these reasons, then, Horsham Trafalgar Neighbourhood Council objects to the application in its current form. Well, I would like to reiterate, we don't object in any way, no one does, to building flats there. We merely feel this is still too overdeveloped and too square. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, which officer would like to respond to these comments? If I may, Chair, I will um, respond there. The comments can probably hey, be back. Just for everybody, it's Adrian Smith. For his Hello. Yes. Um can probably be bracketed into um, amenity design and parking. So I'll take each in turn. I've got um, some slides that I'll share as well. So just bear with me while I load these up for you. So in terms of design, um, there's been obviously discussion about the impact on West Parade um, and building lines, etc. So this image in front of you, which I'll try and make full screen so you can see better, that's it. So on the left shows the existing building line, which Smith and Western breaks at ground floor level. Um, and the image on the right shows the proposal that keeps it broadly in line. It's worth noting Tulip Court on the other side of the south. It does sit very close to West Parade, creating a pinch point at the end of the road there. Um, these are views down West Parade. Um, and hopefully if you can see my cursor up here, the building would sit just left of these trees. These are the trees that are to be retained and sit across into this space here. You can just about see the roof of the existing Smith & Western, which is this section here. So again, the main body of the building here. This is Tulip Court on the right, and this is one of the Walnuts, um, which is recessed on the left-hand side. Um, in terms of the overall design approach, this is, we discussed this in the, the recommendation that, um, paragraphs 6.11 on. Um, and in looking at design, it's important to look at the context and North Parade is a main thoroughfare into, into Horsham. It does have a lot of mixed design approaches, some of which quite old and not exemplar examples, for instance, Tulip Court adjacent. Um, the, the main flat blocks are three stories in its main body, but they also have um, space in the roof. This proposal is low the overall height of Tulip Court, albeit it's got four stories. There are a couple of other buildings in the area which do have four stories as well. It's, it has a brick elevation, which is the main characteristic of all the other properties or the other blocks of flats in the area, and has bay window features again that sort of replicate those, those features. In terms of the roof line, this is a mansard roof, as I said, and in the area of this image here just shows three other examples of mansard roofs. I believe the applicants have taken um, this property down um, on, um, name escapes me, the road down here, uh, forgive me. Um, as an example, again, it's three stories with a mansard roof and a parapet roof line, albeit in a sort of quasi sort of Victorian style, pastiche style, this property. So there, there, there are sort of precedents, if you like, in, in the local area. In terms of the impact on, on the neighbours, that has been carefully considered. So this is Tulip Court, which sits opposite. Um, these large arrows show the two balcony areas that remain. There was a third balcony, if you can see my cursor just on the left hand side here, that has now been removed. Um, so we have a very top floor um, terrace and then two balconies just on the corner here. And this is their direction of outlook, which is towards this um, side elevation here, which contains small windows um, to Tulip Court. What's important is the balconies now don't overlook this area at the back of Tulip Court, which contains lounge windows, etc. The impact on one walnuts. I mean, this property um, forms a part of a terrace that is a slight oddity. It sits much further back from the building line to West Parade. Um, 
and their back garden is north facing and there's been a lot of concern to make sure that the privacy of one of the walnuts is retained as far as possible so we have a 10 meter separation we have an element of planting that will go along the boundary here but most importantly um, as the resident of one of the walnuts did point out is that the, the treatments at first fall level have been revised to remove as many of the windows as possible so for instance this window here if you can see my cursor aligns this um, area here and so would be overlooking the car park rather than the back garden itself and there's a further condition to make sure that the parapet to these bedroom windows at the top here is sufficiently high that it wouldn't afford views down into the back garden equally the stairwell windows are conditioned to be obscure glazed um, in respect of parking um, as set out in the report um, 28 spaces um, which the four tandem ones on West Parade have been discussed those are to be allocated to two of the flats so it's, it's maximizing the, the parking where possible on the site the parking calculator produced by county which is um, targeted in it for this ward Trafalgar ward recommends that if you're allocating parking spaces you'd need 30 if you're unallocating you'd need 24 so in this case we have now 28 parking spaces which sits firmly in the middle of those two the condition that we've applied recommends that all other parking spaces are unallocated to maximize the efficiency of their use because it is recognized as the um, objectors have said that certainly west parade and surrounding streets are heavily parked and then there's very little opportunity for overspill parking in the surrounding area. What's important to note, as has been pointed out, is that we are close to the town centre. We have the train station, town centre, the park and schools, all less than 15 minute walk from the property, which under the sort of current um, discussion around 15 minute neighbourhoods, that would tally with sort of future aspirations. So this is considered to be a sustainable location where future occupiers wouldn't be reliant on uh, car travel for everyday needs. Um, I think I'll call it a day at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call on the local member, Councillor Christine Costin. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, this is a, a very important area to Trafalgar Ward. Um, Leonard and I have been watching this for some time now. I think it's the third time that these plans have been out for consultation. And I mean, what we wanted to do was to have it here to be spoken about at committee so that you can all look at what the prospects are and whether they're going to be right or not. Um, the restaurant has been a tremendous success. I know most people at some point have been, been there and had meals and I'm very glad that it's progressing to go to the town and to take the employment with it, which covers the um, two points, the policy nine and policy 12, which um, allows for the fact that it can now be housing. But that housing has to be right, and it has to be right for the existing uh, residents. Um, and this, at the moment, isn't looking quite as it should. I must say that the report that I have read here is brilliant. It covers everything. It covers every point possible. But it does even say that it recognises that it will have an impact on existing residents. And I think it's quite clear that it will. And if you're coming along North Parade, it's very important. Warnham Road, North Parade, is an important entrance and exit to Horsham Town. Now it's got all sorts of buildings in it. Some of them are brilliant and some are absolutely poor. And what I'd like to see, I want to see it enhance and improve the area. And looking at what we've seen, I honestly feel that there isn't the imagination in the building that I would like to see. Four storeys is too high. The overlooking is very worrying. Um, and it, it is the density, and it's very close to the edge of the pavement and road. Um, I think there are lots of things that need to be re-examined in this. One, of course, is landscaping. There must be some landscaping to soften the whole thing. And I'm quite worried about it, actually. And I've listened to all the speakers, those who approve of it and those who don't. And I am left with this feeling that current residents are going to be really quite inconvenienced by this. And it isn't going to shine a light as people come into Horsham. And really, that's what we want to do. We want really good design that inspires 
Now there are buildings along North Parade that do that, and there are some that are just like biscuit, biscuit barrels, horrible things. But this has got not enough character to fit in to the street scene that I hope that we all enjoy. Um, so can I wait and see what you all have to say about this, please? Before I open it up to the rest of the committee, um, Adrian Smith, do you wish to come back on anything the local member has said? Um, not hugely, Chair. I'll just sort of point out in terms of four storeys, it's not necessarily the number of storeys, it's the height of the building. Um, the four storeys held within a roof form um, that is open to debate. Obviously, the applicants have proposed a mansard to maximise the efficiency of this space. There are examples, as I said, of four storey buildings in the air, albeit predominantly there are three with a roof above. So I think critically it's more important about the scale of the building rather than the number of floors of accommodation. In terms of landscaping, there is landscaping proposed along the North Parade elevation. Just a reminder that those visuals that we showed do, do not show two of the trees which are to be retained. That would certainly start to screen the West Parade elevation on that corner and there would be further smaller tree planting and hedgerows along North Parade. So whilst, yes, it is certainly close to closer to North Parade, there would still be a landscape buffer in there. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right, got a number of speakers coming up. First one is on my screen is Councillor Christian Mitchell. <clears throat> Chairman, I agree with the local member Christine Costin's um, concerns. Um, overall, I think the main issue is it's uh, poor design. Um, I know the area well because it sits on the boundary. That road, North Parade, uh, is the boundary between uh, Holbrook West, which is the ward I represent with Councillor Peter Burgess, and uh, Trafalgar Ward. And so Delancey Court, um, I know well, um, and I remember when it was um, constructed, and I think of the triangulation that the officer, Mr Smith, was showing, um, is quite stark, although um, Tulip Court um, uh, it, it, it isn't necessarily um, of the same design to um, Delancey <laughs> Court. Um, they sit um, in harmony, and this proposed design uh, isn't um, harmonious with either of those two. The officer, Mr Smith, put up a, a very helpful slide, which I'm pleased, because otherwise I'd have invited perhaps some Google street scene. But within uh, spitting distance or within throwing a stone, there was um, an image he put up um, with, to illustrate the Hansard um, slide roofs. But in those um, images, one, of course, is the block of flats on the former um, Victorian property on North, uh, Northbrook College um, at Hurst Road. Um, I would have preferred to see some, at the time, some variation of what was there, but um, what is there is infinitely better than this. Um, but interestingly, and I've referred to it in a number of uh, planning meetings, um, on North Parade, on that same slide, I don't know if it can be put up, um, it was the um, image of the Hansard slide roofs. There's um, a picture of, um, which I accept, and it was described at the time, um, a pastiche Victorian building. Um, but the history back in 2007-8 time, when that um, Victorian house was demolished, um, we had something not dissimilar to this, something um, unattractive and rather hideous. Uh, it was refused the committee and the applicants went away and came back uh, with this extremely high quality design that's been there now for over 10 years. And uh, I know many people new to the area, um, aren't aware that it is actually a modern building. So I think the architects um, haven't uh, looked uh, in the very near locality. And what is there is proposed is, is perhaps uh, something that would is not dissimilar to what's at Kingsgate, um, but that was in a unique development um, on the old brewery site, and this isn't. It's got to sit harmoniously. I think the end of the block as one approaches from North Parade towards Horsham, that's extremely stark. Um, applicants are forever quoting the MPPF about um, uh, that, um, that uh, this will be um, uh, much needed homes and the MPPF about um, that um, people will be able to walk to work and, and so on. Um, but they don't seem to very often want to quote the MPPF about high quality designs. And, and I don't think this is a high quality design. Um, it would uh, be in character in other near neighbouring towns, but it's not in character here. And my concern, why I've referred to the other properties, this is important because this will set a precedent. It may be in time other 
properties come available. Um, there was on the corner of Hurst Road at one time, not many years ago, two or three of those semi-detached and uh, properties uh, at one time were going to become available for flats. Uh, and I worry about um, some of the old care homes on Hurst Road, one that's just recently been sold. And what I don't want is that we have a precedent for this and in the future applicants say, well, we've got something very modern on the corner of uh, West and North Parade and let's have this now on, uh, on, on the top end of Hurst Road. So um, I really can't support uh, this at all. Um, I'm not distracted or perturbed about suggestions, these inferences about, well, you know, this is far better than having drive through restaurants. Um, I, I think that um, whilst I totally agree, um, what I don't want is that anyone to feel under any pressure that we must accept this today, otherwise we're going to have some dreadful fast food restaurant there with smells and motor cars moving around. So I don't know why that was brought into the debate. I know the applicants have been looking at flats for quite a long time, over a year. Um, so um, I would support any proposal if um, Councillor Costin, having listened to the debate, wished to refuse it. But there's no way I could support this at all in its current form. It's too tall, it's too big, it's too overbearing, it doesn't fit into the scene. It's too important a corner uh, to rush this through. Um, there's no point deferring it. it. It will have to be rejected, in my view, and come back with something more aesthetically appropriate, taking design cues from Delancey Court, a high quality finished building. Um, because otherwise it's the same again. We've seen this design before it and, and we can bring that, chop them all out. You know, it looks Councilor like- Mitchell, can I ask you to sign I'm up? just wrapping up, Chairman. We can chop them all out. It looks like a prison block or a university hall of residence or a borstal, um, which it does. Um, but Horsham and the town centre needs better and deserves better. So those are my um, views, uh, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Ruth Fletcher. Thank you very much. Well, like others, I'll be really pleased to see the continued success of Smith and Weston in the town centre. And um, I have no objection in principle, I think, uh, to the use of this as for flats. It seems entirely appropriate. But I would very much echo the concerns about uh, design. We keep on saying that as a council, we support, as NPPF says we should, good design. And it seems to me that this is a, a test case of whether we really do support good design. Um, I think that it is, um, it, it is somewhat a case of overdevelopment, but it is also um, not the sort of feature building that you want in such a prominent corner. And I think the, um, the design and access statement and so on goes on about other buildings and it being in keeping with them in a, in a rather selective way. I'm talking about the character of the, the street being large, flatted buildings. Um, I'd, I'd say that if you, if you um, walk, drive or cycle along this road, the character of the road is actually to some extent more like a boulevard in many respects. It's You see a lot of trees, there's a lot of setback, there's a lot of the green verge and I think that setting this so close to the uh, to the road is is a big mistake here it's out of keeping with all the uh, uh, surrounding flats and with the houses further along the road and I think uh, pushing it right up to uh, as close as it is to the boundary it is a big mistake um, right. so Sorry? Sorry, I thought you, I was about to say. I, oh, I, was, to I wanted to make a couple of um, more detailed points. Um, I'm concerned about the tandem parking. Um, West Parade is a one way street and it's a very narrow street. Um, residents um, report uh, that they significantly, you know, they have problems with this when lorries drive down West Parade and then get stuck as it narrows. Um, I think it's entirely inappropriate to have tandem parking which will require people to shuffle their cars in and out and go the wrong way along the one-way street simply to get the back car out from behind the front car. Um, the cycle parking as shown in the diagram is extraordinarily cramped. Um, it claims to have 24 cycle spaces, but you'd probably have to take all the pedals off and turn the handlebars around to actually fit them in. Um, so I think that needs looking at again. Um, we now should be designing to LTN 120, which has much higher standards for cycle parking. We should be um, providing for cycles that uh, 
are tricycles for people with mobility impairments. And we should actually be thinking about people who want mobility scooters as well. I think that really does need um, more serious consideration. Um, and lastly, I don't know whether this counts technically as design, but do we have to have a gated development? They're very unsociable things. We don't live in a society where we need to keep out marauders. Um, the, gates, the gates keep out people who are just leafleting, casually visiting, want to drop something off at somebody's house. Um, it's incredibly unfriendly. Um, and when you look at the way the entrance is designed with the gates, um, there has to be a pedestrian entrance beside, and the, the footway, the pavement, just sort of disappears into a, into a curved curb that sort of drops the, the pedestrians nowhere, prioritising the cars. I, I, I really don't like that. I, I, I would hope that that minor detail could be looked at as well. So if, um, if uh, one of the councillors is minded to uh, reject this on um, or propose a contrary motion on grounds of overdevelopment, design and so on, I would be happy to support that. Right, thank you. Councillor Brian Donnelly. Thank you, Chairman. I agree with what Councillor Mitchell and others have said, uh, particularly Councillor Mitchell was covering a lot of the area I was going to. It, it does worry me that we appear determined to turn lovely Horsham Town into a tip and a giant parking site. It just seems absolutely ridiculous and it's been well covered already. I think this maximizing of space, in fact, is a, a, a way the developer uses to maximize profit. And if I had won the lottery, I'd be doing the same. So I'm not being critical of them. But I just think the quality of life for the individuals in these areas is getting worse and worse and worse. On bicycles, there shouldn't be 24 cycle spaces. They probably should be 50 spaces. Electric vehicle charging points, there should be one on every parking space. I mean, the whole intent, isn't it, is to put us all in electric cars by 2030 or something. And if we don't make the duck provisions now, it's going to be an expensive process in the future. To go on to the parking aspect, unfortunately, the county's parking calculator always is used as the big stick to beat us with. But one must never forget that parking's objective is to minimize car travel. And that's also highlighted in what the officers are saying. So the parking calculator is not looking at providing parking spaces. It's actually aimed at reducing parking spaces. Some surveys done over the past five years of uh, buildings with one bedroom flats in them um, shows that most of them in fact have two cars, some have even more. So parking space is a reality. And I mean, these, the old hairy one has always says sustainable location, that word sustainable, you know, I don't think it's really genuine. Um, whereas car ownership, not critical in order to reach shop services, Paris 6.40 and workplaces. On this basis, the risk of overspill parking is considered limited. On the contrary, on the contrary, the risk of overspill parking is colossal. And you won't be able to move on some of those roads in the next few years if this sort of project goes ahead. And we see this problem time after time, not just in Horsham Town, which I must say surprised me a wee bit when I got into it last year, but in the rural areas as well. So I think really we need a lot more imagination to try to build areas that give people more space and a sense of quality of life. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Tony Hogman. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Councillor Mitchell pretty much said everything. Um, this almost feels like a speculative application to me. It feels that the developers put in a, a first draft trying to cram as many properties on the site as possible. Um, I'm actually very surprised. I mean, obviously, thank the officers for their time. It's obviously put a lot of effort in, but uh, I'm surprised that this is this is in front of us for recommendation for acceptance. Um, I personally design, find the design bland, ugly, stark, overbearing, totally out of keeping character with the street scene. Um, the three flats opposite it all appear to be three stories. Now, I, I hear the the, um, the officer mentioned ridge height, and, and and yes, we do take ridge height into consideration, but. But it is, in my opinion, it is out of character with the street scene. Um, 
the it's as close as it can be possibly to the curb almost and it's going to make that junction feel closed and small um two of the three properties uh, the other facts are interesting enough are are equally close i appreciate that but the third one um on the opposite junction is is much further back and, and shallower and stepped back so i empathize with the objectors uh, particularly uh, mr bates from horsham society i thought uh, his reasons for objection could pretty much mirror um if council could um if one of the councillors, Councillor Cossing, was to put in a, a, a secondary motion to reject this, I, I think that most of um, Mr. Bates's objections for, were, were valid. Um, I think it's out of keep and character with the street scene. Um, I absolutely agree with Councillor Dolly on the parking. I think it's not enough parking. Um, and I think I'll stop there because Councillor Mitchell's pretty much summarised for everyone. I've got three more speakers coming in and then I shall go to the officers to ask them to calm up and then back to Councillor Christine Costin, who I'm fairly sure is going to make a proposal. So we'll go, the three speakers coming up are Councillor Billy Greening, Richard Landerhue and Councillor Claire Vickers. So we'll hear your thoughts and then, then come to a conclusion. Uh, Councillor Billy Greening. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously brownfield regeneration is important, but we're still gonna be having to build on greenfield sites anyway. So the design is subjective and my personal opinion is obviously compared to the other courts, you, the, the density is lower. Um, one thing that people haven't mentioned so far is the affordability and that this site will provide no on-site affordable housing, 0%. Now, the applicant has provided an independent viability report, which I've read, and it states that um, they won't be able to provide, a, the, the site isn't viable at 35%, but it's also not viable at the current at zero percent anyway the site should be providing eight affordable homes six affordable rent two shared ownership per uh, the hdpf policy 16. now i understand councillor costin that you're going to uh, recommend uh, that this is thrown out but for, for whatever reason if that doesn't pass i would like to propose to the officers that we have a late review mechanism put in place which would mean that if this application was to move forward more money for affordable homes would come would come forward if there was an uplift in value on the site and i'd welcome the officer's advice on when uh, in when during the process that would be most suitable as at the moment only one hundred fifty four thousand uh, pounds is currently outlined and zero percent on-site affordable is not acceptable so i'd welcome the officer's view if a late review mechanism to be added to the section 106 if approved is acceptable Right. Well, I'll take the next two speakers and then the officers can come back on all the many comments that have been Thank made. You, so, Councillor Richard Landy, you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you, of course, speaking this far down the list, everybody said something. Uh, I was going to mention uh, the affordable as well that Billy had. I mean, in re reading it, apparently we're going to get the equivalent of what would have been two affordables, but... Um, they're not attractive, apparently, to any of the associations. But I wonder, unfortunately, Councillor Utah is not here, whether it might have been attractive to Horsham Homes. Um, so yeah, I think, yes, the same with Billy, there should be eight affordables um, in there. I've also can confirm I do have some experience of parking in Tulip Court. My in-laws lived there until they passed away in 2005. And there was a big problem with parking then. I think from memory, there are only about eight spaces in Tulip Court for something like 18 flats. So adding this, uh, I think if we were to produce our own uh, parking uh, parameters, we'd probably be looking for over 40 parking spaces for this new development. Um, basically, I agree with everything that's been said about uh, the size, look, etc. I think this is over development. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the last speaker on this is Councillor Vickers. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Well, you, you Councillor Vickers, could you keep it fairly swift? I will indeed, because most of what I was going to say has already been said. But <coughs> I'm a lone voice in the wilderness here because I commend the officers for set, getting the huge improvements to the original application. Um, and to remind members that this is a brownfield site inside the built up area boundary of Horsham. So it fits with our HDPF policies. I think design is always subjective and we all have different views on what is good design. And I'm a traditionalist, so I usually like traditional design, but I actually think this one fits in quite well. And we do need these smaller units in Horsham Town um, so that people can get on the uh, property ladder. 
I see there's seven one bedroom and 13 two bedroom flats and I know those are much needed. Um, so I know I'm a lone voice in the wilderness, but quite frankly, I would have been supporting this application. I think I'm the only one that's going to though. Thank you. Well, I'll sneak in an extra one at the end. I agree with you, Councillor Vickers. Um, but before I go to Councillor Christine Costin, who I'm fairly sure I picked up is going to make a counter proposal, I'll go to the officers to, to um, answer that. Adrian Smith, are you? Um, I'm going? here, yes. I'm um, sure you've got a lot to say. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I won't take up too, too much time. I've made several points already, which have obviously been reflected in the comments back. Um, I'm just going to sh share a screen again, but whilst I do so, um, I'll just answer a couple of questions about the affordable housing. So this is a scheme that has been through viability appraisal with independent um, assessors on our, on our behalf. Um, and the applicants um, viability assessment said that there'd be no affordable on here because it wasn't possible, mainly because of the high existing use value of the restaurant on the site. Um, our value has identified that by squeezing the profit margin, it would be possible to get £150,000 of a commuted sum. So that's um, what is being secured in the legal agreement. And in accordance with uh, Councillor Greening, we can include a review mechanism to um, capture any overage, a proportion of any overage, um, should that arise um, um, at the end of the development. Um, in terms of gated community, I believe Councillor Fletcher raised, um, I will just scroll to the, the site layout. Um, these are the gates into the car park, but each flat and each house has its own access point or shared access point directly from North Parade, which wouldn't require any person going through a locked gate. Um, appreciate obviously the car park at the back would be a locked gate for security purposes, but it wouldn't mean that um, any, um, postman, for instance, wouldn't be able to, to go to the front doors of each property. Um, in terms of design, um, I have um, addressed this before, um, the views of officers on this one. And if we take it back to the, the, the street scene here, the Launcy Court, Tulip Court, etc. You can see at the moment the building does sit quite prominently close to North Parade with quite a harsh frontage, these trees to be retained. Um, the proposal does obviously sit fairly close to um, the street, but you can see down here we've got hedgerows, we've got um, tree planting as well to, to soften it in. In terms of sort of scale, the main body of the Launcy Court here you can see is three storey with capacity in the roof um, potentially got three stores again with two courts with further roof lights above the proposal does um reflect if you like if i go to the visuals here the three-story main body and it's using efficient space within the roof and i remind members that the mppf requires us to make efficient and effective use of our land particularly brownfield land and this is obviously always a balance between scale and form of development parking provision etc it's not possible to obtain all at the same time um, the views of officers, uh, as I said before, is that it does pick up on the various aspects of the character of the area, which is uh, the, the brick tones, the brick finishes, um, the, the format of the buildings, the bay uh, projections, etc. Um, it also includes the more sort of contemporary large windows to break up otherwise quite bland, um, extensive brickwork that you see on other buildings in the area, H hence the recommendation for approval, but obviously it's a subjective matter of design. So and um, caution that the, the character of the area is important to inform a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does the head of planning want to bring anything before I go back to the local member? Um, I may comment on the motion, if that's OK, Chair, depending on what's put forward. Of course. Uh, Councillor Christine Costin. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I think the, the general view that everybody has taken is that this building really is the scale and form of it is out of character um, with the street scene. And I think I think Horsham is so important and, and its entrances, its exits, we do not want to diminish what is there. And this building just doesn't, well, it just doesn't add. It's supposed to enhance and improve the street scene. It does not do that. In fact, I think that it, it rather spoils it. And the residents that are there already, and the established residents, are going to see um, a huge change, which will have an adverse effect on them. And that is also part of it. I mean, there's so many things. I'd like to see more um, affordable. I'd like it to have affordable housing in it, but it hasn't. We have to take the commuted sum, which that's fine, but I'd like actually for it to have 
affordable housing within it, which it hasn't. But even then, the design needs to fit with what Horsham needs, and this simply doesn't. The parking is inadequate because the streets are all around Trafalgar in that particular area. The car the park is a nightmare, and it's going to get worse over time. Okay. You know, obviously, we will need the bike racks and things, of course. But yes, I must say that I'm therefore saying I'll put down for refusal. Okay. I think I got the impression that Councillor Christian Mitchell was going to second you. Was that correct? <clears throat> yes, I'm happy to, unless Councillor Fletcher wished to, but I'm happy to second um, a counter motion to refuse. Oh, you're there now. Sorry, your pictures keep moving around on the screen. I can't see you to look at. <laughs> Councillor Mitchell, would you like to come forward with some other views, um, other reasons for refusal to add to Councillor Costin's? Because I'm not sure there were quite enough there. Um, uh, <clears throat> over massing, um, over development, um, not, not um, loss of amenity, um, not sitting sympathetically uh, in the street scene and not enhancing, uh, not high quality design um, per the MPPF. Um, I'm sure other members, Councillor Fletcher might be able to assist with some other points, um, but those are my ones. Well, you're the seconder. Right. Briefly, Councillor Fletcher. I think Councillor Mitchell's covered everything. It's a case of um, agreeing wording with the officers. Sorry, Chair, uh, can, I, can I raise a point of order? Sorry. Can I add in, it's not compliant with policy 16 of the HDPF as it doesn't, on the affordability, so it doesn't meet the 35%. Mm. If, that, if, if that's acceptable, of course, to the local member in the, uh, proposing and seconding. Apologies. Mm. Yes, because I think there's many strings to the bow, um, so that um, if the applicants were to challenge it, that it's um, the officers can robustly defend the committee's decision if they're minded to vote uh, in accordance with the motion, the counter motion. So, yes, I'm happy to take that on board, Councillor Green. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Emma Parks, Head of Planning. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just, just want to comment on some of those reasons put forward by Councillor Costin and, and Councillor Mitchell. Um, my colleague has has talked about design and, and, and the subjective element to it. Um, and, and so therefore, you know, having considered members' concerns, if members were to, to move forward with a refusal on, on those grounds, um, that, that is reasonable. Obviously, that, that's not the officer's view, but, but it's not an unreasonable conclusion for members. Um, if I can now move in turn to the other points that have been raised um, in terms of parking in my view it's difficult to substantiate a reason for refusal in parking it meets the county parking standards we've got no evidence of an objection from county highways or a highway safety issue and therefore I would advise members against refusing it on on inadequate parking in terms of amenity if, if that's in relation to neighboring occupiers um, obviously, officers have worked hard in terms of amending the scheme um, to make it acceptable for, from a neighbour amenity point of view. And therefore, I, I would raise concerns in terms of refusing it on that basis. In terms of affordable housing, um, officers have consulted with an independent expert, our own consultant on affordable housing. And whilst it's extremely disappointing that the development doesn't provide um, the 35%, our policy allows for a lesser amount if it can be demonstrated that it's not viable and therefore it's not contrary to policy whilst it doesn't meet our expected standards. It's disappointing that we've got no on-site delivery, but that has been explored with officers and the applicants and therefore I think the proposal on the table for affordable housing is reasonable whilst disappointing um, and therefore I would advise against members raising objections in terms of affordable housing. I think it's important to note that each reason has to be reasonable and justified and therefore it's not a case of just adding additional reasons on. In, in my professional opinion, um, the, the, the concerns expressed by Councillor Coxton and Councillor Mitchell are, are a reasonable reason for refusal in relation to design and the impact on, on, on the character and appearance of the street scene. Thank you. So just so we get it clear, before I go to a vote, you are recommending that we go for the two refusals. Um, are the proposer and seconder happy with those? I can see Councillor yes. um, Christian yeah. nodding. Councillor Mitchell? Right. So I'm happy as the are you all clear on what? 
Sorry, Councillor Mitchell. I'm happy as the our officers advise. So perhaps mm -hmm. on this occasion, um, we'll leave out um, the point on affordable homes as a as a reason. So I'm happy as earlier mm -hmm. said. Okay. So are you all clear on that? In that case, um, not entirely. Can you just summarise what those reasons are that we are voting on now? Um, if, if I can comment, Chairman, um, unless Adrian, Adrian, did you want to come in? Um, just, just two points. I do have sort of listened to what um, uh, councillors have said in terms of wording. So I do have a draft design refusal here that might be worth sharing with you. In terms of the um, the affordable housing, what I would say is that as a technical point, we don't have a legal agreement to secure the money. So technically it does require to be a second refusal reason, but that's not on the basis that it's not being provided. It's just the basis not secured what they're proposing, if that makes sense. Um, so the wording for the design refusal reason I have here is the scale, design and form of the proposed building is out of character with the street scene and fails to enhance the character of the area, contrary to policies 32 and 33 of the Horsham District Planning Framework. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Yep, you're happy with that. Very good, Chair. I'm very happy. Thank you. All right. So we're going out to the vote if democratic services can do it. I think I know all members are, are familiar with this, but for people who are watching from outside, uh, democratic services will take each individual vote so you can hear how we're all voting. When you're ready, um, I'm not sure who's doing it. but Thank you. Yep, I'll be doing it this evening. Um, so this is a vote for refusal on this application. So Councillor <coughs> Allen. Four. Thank you. Councillor Baldwin. Four. Councillor Bevis. Four. Councillor Bradnam. Four. Councillor Britton. Four. Councillor Karen Burgess. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Cornell. Four. Councillor Costin. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Fletcher. Four. Councillor Greening. Four. Councillor Haig. Four. Councillor Hogbin. Four. Councillor Kitchen. Against. Councillor Landyu. Four. Councillor Lindsay. Four. Councillor Mild. Four. Councillor Minto. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Newman. Four. Thank you. Councillor Potter. Four. Councillor Ritchie. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Skip. Four. Councillor Stannard. Four. Councillor Vickers. Against. And Councillor Walters. Four. Thank you. So that is 22 votes for, two against and two abstentions. So the motion to refuse has been carried. Thank you. Now I need some um, legal advice here. Do we now have to take the counter one or does that go as um, it clearly was asked? Could I give advice on this, Chair? Um, we, we don't have to take any further votes on anything. Right. We've, we've now got our decision. So that is refused? Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you for that. I just wanted to get it completely clear. All right. So we'll now move on to the next item on the agenda, which is items seven and eight will be um, presented together. But when it comes to the vote, we will take the votes uh, seven and eight separately. So when you're when you're ready, we'll move on to that. Thank you, Amy. Great. Thank you, Chair. Planning permission and listed building consent is sought for the conversion of the engine house at Kings Mill in Shipley to a two bedroom residential property. The proposal has been amended during consideration of the application with the original submission seeking consent to convert the lower floors of the windmill as well as the engine house to create a larger three bedroom dwelling, whereas the proposal before members seeks the conversion of the engine house only. The proposal for the conversion of the engine house into a dwelling has been submitted with the intended aim of securing a long-term solution to finance the ongoing repair and maintenance work required to ensure the condition of the mill is not at risk. 
members will note that an addendum was issued yesterday which corrects an error in the recommendation relating to public access being available to the windmill which the applicant has advised would make the development unviable due to the cost of insurance along with provided providing updated comments from the society ongoing repair and maintenance work uh, for the Sorry, I can hear my, myself echoing. Um, I'll start that sentence again. Members will note that the addendum was issued yesterday, which corrects an error in the recommendation relating to public access being available to the windmill, which the applicant has advised would make the development unviable due to the cost of insurance, along with providing updated comments from the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. In addition, members are advised in the addendum that the council has been provided with a copy of the applicant's mortgage illustration and an offer letter. Notwithstanding the submission of these documents, it is recommended that a Section 106 agreement should include a clause requiring confirmation of funding being secured prior to the commencement of development. This would include the submission of a secured mortgage offer or confirmation of funds from another source, and if the clause cannot be met, then the development cannot be implemented. This would ensure the restoration and ongoing maintenance of the windmill was secured through the legal agreement. Just for members to note that in addition, since the reports have been published, two further letters of objection have been received to both the planning application and the listed building consent application. The main issues raised in these letters are considered to be have been outlined already at paragraphs 3.5 and 3.6 and 3.6 and 3.7 of the relevant reports. So Kings Mill is situated in a rural location outside of any defined built up area boundary. It is situated on the south side of School Lane, a country lane reached off Red Lane and Pound Lane in Shipley. The application relates to the conversion of the engine house attached to the eastern side of the windmill and seen shaded green on the plan. The site is located within the Shipley conservation area and is a grade two star listed building. The engine house is shown shaded red and is a single storey building as shown in the, the photo. There are a number of listed buildings in the vicinity of the site shown by the yellow stars and there is a public footpath running north south to the west of the windmill as shown by the green line. So the engine house is attached to the windmill and currently consists of corrugated metal sheet walls, large timber barn doors to the north elevation with metal gable end above a corrugated metal roof finished with black, black bitumen and a timber framed, timber framed white casement windows. Dilapidated timber structures used for the storage, uh, use for storage, um, which are attached and shown in this location are to proposed for removal. So the engine house is currently used for storage and was erected shortly after the mill was completed in order to drive the millstones and machinery when there was no wind. The original engine serving the windmill was removed and has been replaced with the existing engine, which is to be retained and as shown in red as part of this conversion scheme. So the proposal as amended to include the engine house only would see the following alterations to the engine house to facilitate its conversion to a dwelling. The restoration and redecoration of existing windows, the installation of new windows to the east elevation in this location, Relocation and slight widening of the doors on the west and south elevations as seen in these, these elevation drawings. The removal of existing corrugated metal sheets to the walls and replacement with um, like for like materials and the replacement of the corrugated roof sheets with new insulated roof panels. And also the removal of a dilapidated lean to structure in that location. So internally, the works propose the installation um, in installation of the floor and ceilings, the creation of new stud walls on the inside of the existing timber structure to create bedrooms and a bathroom, and the internal lining of the walls and installation behind the large doors to the north elevation, so that the doors on the north elevation would be retained. Externally, grass creek would be laid to create a parking area in this location, and the engine would be retained and encased within a kitchen island um, and breakfast bar area, as shown in red. So just turn into some photos of the um, site. In addition to the recladding of the walls and roof and the restoration of the existing windows, to the east elevation, the main alterations would be the removal of the lean-to structure that can just be seen there, um, and the insert insertion of two windows um, above. 
to the south elevation, um, the main alteration would be the widening of an existing door opening. To the west elevation, again, the main alteration would be um, the slight relocation of the door. And to the north elevation, um, there would be no changes as the existing doors would be uh, retained, but insulated internally. So as members will be aware, there's been significant objection to both the planning application and the listed building consent application relating to the conversion of the en engine house, including from Sussex Industrial Archaeological Society, Sussex Mills Group and the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings as well as Shipley Parish Council and these objections are set out at section three of the reports. English Heritage have concluded in their most recent responses to the applications, again as set out in the reports, that if the applications are to be approved they should be controlled by a conditional legal agreement that requires the monies generated to be tied to the repair and maintenance of the windmill in perpetuity and also that some level of public access to the building such as Heritage Open Days is secured as part of these proposals. As outlined at the beginning of the presentation and within the addendum um, sent out yesterday, the applicant has advised that providing public access to the windmill would make the development unviable due to the cost of insurance. It should be noted that this application does not permanently restrict access to the windmill in the future, and this is something we would encourage the applicant to reconsider. The windmill will have an entirely separate entrance and if the owners felt inclined to open the windmill to the public again in the future, this would still be workable and achievable in our view. The council's conservation officer has advised that he is satisfied that the harm that will be, be caused as a result of the conversion, for example, the works themselves and also the paraphernalia associated with the domestic use is less than substantial and is outweighed by the public benefit of ensuring funding is available for the conservation of the asset the windmill in the future and to prevent further deterioration in the short term. A review of the applicant's financial appraisal has been carried out by an independent consultant on behalf of the council. The consultant has confirmed that the applicant's intention is to let the property on the open market with a buy to let mortgage providing funds for the repair work to the windmill on conversion of the engine house. The income generated from the renting of the engine house would be tied to the maintenance and repair schedule in perpetuity by means of a section 106 agreement that ties 30% of the revenue to be used for the ongoing maintenance of the windmill in addition to a one-off major repair works cost which is just under £84,000. In addition, it's recommended that the Section 106 agreement includes a clause requiring confirmation of funding being secured prior to commencement of development along with clauses to retain the windmill and the engine house within the same ownership and occupation of the engine house on a rental basis only. The income generated from the renting of the engine house, which is identified as a heritage benefit and which may be, out, which may be weighed against the less than substantial harm I identified, is considered sufficient to secure the future of the windmill. It is considered that the scheme as submitted and as amended to include the engine house only has reached the point where the benefits of conversion to residential use outweigh the harm to the special interest of the listed building. And on this basis, and for the reasons outlined in the report, is recommended that listed building is granted subject to the conditions within the report and that planning permission is granted subject to the completion of a section 106 agreement and appropriate conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. We have the first speaker, who is Norman Carrick, who is speaking to us on Zoom. Um, so they have more to send us for the old Good ones. evening. Over the years, more harm has been caused to historic buildings by ill-conceived schemes intended to preserve them than by neglect alone. <laughs> historic buildings do not fall down overnight, but they can be irrevocably damaged at one stroke by misguided proposals to support them. These applications fall into this category. The vast majority of local residents, industrial archaeology specialists and conservation bodies are of the view that no development on this sensitive site is acceptable. These concerns relate to the entire mill, including the engine house. This engine house is an integral and vital part of the complete structure, as is specifically noted in the grade two star listing. For the working life of the mill, the engine house was the major source of power, so it would be impossible for future generations to understand the working of the mill without it. The description of this proposal of change of use is highly misleading. The engine house was a simple timber construction with corrugated iron sheeting, 
So after 140 years, it is totally unsuitable for conversion into a modern dwelling. The plans reveal that little would remain of the existing structure, resulting in a mere pastiche, permanently destroying its historic character. The applicants have presented this application as a binary choice between conversion on the one hand or the destruction of the mill through lack of maintenance on the other. There is actually a third option which has not been properly explored. Historic England, the definitive conservation body, state that the options of re-establishing the mill as a visitor attraction operated under a trust should be given serious consideration before the conversion of the mill is accepted. Between 1952 and 2009, the mill was successfully maintained and restored at little cost to the owners with public funds from various sources. It's only since 2009 under the current owners that maintenance has been neglected to the point where there is now a backlog of work needed. Although the Shipley Mill Charitable Trust no longer exists, King's Mill is still held in great regard by the local community. Although inevitably many of those involved in the original trust are no longer around, in recent months there has been a considerable groundswell of interest in reviving it, with many pledging that they would like to be involved should the old trust be revived or a new one created. Many historic structures are operated successfully by charitable trusts and many methods of fundraising not envisaged in 2009 are now available. If you vote for this scheme today, you will guarantee that Shipley Mill will never again be a working mill open to the public. If you refuse this application, there remain other options to secure a viable future as a working mill, perhaps in the future with a more enlightened owner, which have quite wrongly been dismissed. It is your duty as councillors to explore these. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, ne the next speaker is also on Zoom, is um, Peter James. Uh, James, yes, yeah, sorry. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Yes, um, I'm a, mill a local milling expert and the committee member of the Sussex Mills Group. I'm also chairman of the Lowford Heath Windmill Trust, a nearby tourist attraction opening a windmill. I understand this is a difficult case as the primary objective is quite rightly to secure the future maintenance of the windmill. However, there are still a few concerns that require either amendment or further explanation. In the HCC Planning Committee report in paragraph 6.2.1, 6.21, the figures suggest that the repair works will be financed by the ability of the applicants to obtain a mortgage for the residential development and will be covered by 30% of the revenue of the rental over a period of 10 years. Note this conflicts with the design and access statement, which states 25% on page 15. The, the time period of 10 years conflicts with the HDC conservation report stating, to this end, it is appropriate that the income from the residential use is tied to a maintenance and repair schedule in perpetuity, not 10 years. So as it stands, what happens after the 10 years? There are no guarantees that any rental income will be used for the mill after this time whatsoever. I do not accept the applicant's assertion that conversion is the only funding option. The creation of a new charitable trust should be explored, and it is believed that there is considerable support for such within the parish of Shipley. Although I do not know how HTC could compel the owner to agree to such a proposal. Note the previous lease was given up by volunteers because it would not be extended by the owner. Should circumstances change in the future and the mill be reopened as a tourist attraction, the loss of the engine shed will compromise the viability in regard to exhibition stroke, stroke museum space. And lastly, upon hearing that mill cannot be open to visitors, this is a major concern and in my mind is just not acceptable as there is no point in conserving the windmill without public access. What are people to, are going to learn about how an historic windmill works and operates. It's not just a pretty thing to look at from the outside. I do not see why public liability insurance would be so expensive as Lowford Heath Windmills, and remember, remember I'm the chair, uh, insurance for public opening costs only a few hundred pounds per year. So I really don't understand what this last late uh, letter was about. And I believe the application should be refused on this count alone, as well as taking into my account my other concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker, Robin Nugent, is coming to us on video. Good 
Good afternoon. I'm Robin Nugent, the architect for the project at the Kings Mill at Shipley. We are all privileged to live in an area where the Shipley Mill is an icon of Sussex. Kings Mill has for years been used in publicity, not only by Horsham District Council, but by the County Council as well. And the reason why we have the benefit of this mill in our presence is that it was saved by Hillier Belloc and repaired, and his successive generations have maintained it and brought it down to the current day, where it is one of the few survivors that has the potential to be put back into working order. We have produced a project with the help of the Inspector of Historic England, Alma Hal, and your own Conservation Officer, Sean Ricks. And together with the support of Kate Turner, the Planning Case Officer, we now have before us a project to provide the mill with a sustainable future. The current owners, in advancing years, want to try and provide this secure future. We now need your help to ensure that this project succeeds and that we can then pass on the mill to successive generations so our grandchildren and their children can have the benefit that we have of seeing this beautiful mill in the Sussex countryside. In anticipation of your support, thank you. Right, thank you. And um, the last speaker on this is um, Shipley Parish Council, Ginny DeZoot. Good evening to you, wherever you are. She's coming in on Zoom, is she with us? Um, yes, she is there. She's muted at the moment. I'll try and unmute her. Well, um, yes, it says Nicholas de Zoo. Could you unmute yourself before you speak, please? Okay, I, I, I hope that's okay now, is it? Yes, you've done it. Okay, good. Oh. Okay. Um, my name is Ginny Dezoot. Um, I'm from Shipley Parish Council. Shipley Windmill lies within a historic conservation area, which includes the 12th century Knights Templar Church. The Shipley Windmill is the last smock mill in the county capable of working and ought to be maintained for the benefit of future generations. It is grade two star listed. Shipley has never had such a high level of objections in living memory to a planning application. You will have seen the parish councillors' uh, objections in the official uh, report. So the first one is the design. Members noted that the professional objections from English heritage and historic England and supported their findings and recommendations. For history and amenity, members noted the large number of objections, the most received in recent times, from both local residents and from further afield. Members agreed with the majority of comments that the windmill is a local community asset and that the removal of the engine room would be hugely detrimental and at odds with the grade two star listing. The conclusion and decision on balance, all the consultee reports before members seem to agree that the amended application will not change the preservation of the windmill any more than compared to the current situation. On the financial side, members were not convinced that the financial model proposed by the applicant was sustainable, creating a risk that the income from the proposed development may not fund maintenance of the windmill in future years and that the funding options the members pointed out that other funding options to maintain the windmill had been proposed in the past but had been rejected by the applicant. These options were not considered in the financial analysis provided by the applicant. These options would have afforded the opportunity for grant income to maintain the windmill. The windmill is a significant community asset and the objections which you'll have all read in section three 
uh, have come from not just Shipley and historical associations, i.e. historical <laughs> England, etc., but also from far and wide, which reflects its importance. The Sussex Mills Group state in paragraph one of their objections that the engine shed is a critical and unique feature of the mill. It is a relatively lightweight timber construction covered with corrugated iron sheeting. Hence, it will not be possible to convert it into suitable living com accommodation complying with all the necessary building regulations in the way proposed without fundamental change <laughs> to its historic fabric. Furthermore, being within the cartilage of the listed building, it will also have a negative impact on the windmill. The future of the windmill could have been assured many years ago, but verbal financial offers were rejected by the applicant. There are still financial offers of support present today from the community and beyond. Right, that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you for Thank you very much for that. That's um, very kind. Right, as usual, I shall go to the officers to, um, to, to, to make comments on the speakers and then to the local members. Not sure who's, Amy, are you doing this? I'll, I'll make a start, yes. Um, so there was quite a lot of um, different issues mentioned. So in terms of um, alternative funding, um, we have been advised by the applicant that whilst verbal approaches have been made in the past, that they've actually had nothing in writing and therefore consequently they haven't taken these forward as being realistic options. Um, in terms of alternative proposals, um, office planning officers and also um, the conservation officer have had um, discussions with the applicant and the agent about alternative proposals um, to generate funds to facilitate the ongoing maintenance and repair of the windmill. However, these options weren't considered um, by the applicant to be achievable or deliverable as outlined at um, paragraph 6.2 of the, of the report um, in the planning application. And we were satisfied with, with um, the outcome of those discussions. Um, in terms of the, the retention of the engine, um, we're satisfied that the retention of the machinery within the, so that's the engine, within the engine house, will maintain the understanding of how the mill was operated on a windless day. Um, and in doing so, so in keeping that um, engine um, within the building, preserves um, an understanding and meaning of how, of how the building has been used in the past. Um, in terms of the um, potential for reopening um, the mill, um, as I outlined previously, the application before members doesn't permanently restrict public access to the windmill in the future, and that's something that we would um, encourage the applicant to reconsider. Um, the windmill does have um, an entirely separate entrance, and if the owners felt inclined to open the windmill to the public again, um, we consider that would still be a workable and achievable achievable option available to them. Right, did um, Emma, did you want to come in on this or are you? Um, just, just to quickly add Chairman, um, you know, officers have had this application in for some considerable time uh, and there have been a number of amendments to, to the scheme. Um, officers are of the view that on balance and, and with um, the elements that we've detailed that would could be secured or and would be secured within a, within a section 106 legal agreement that the benefits of, of securing the long-term management and maintenance of, of the listed building outweigh the, the less than substantial harm which has been ident identified through through the proposal thank you thank you very much well i'll go to the local members now uh councillor gordon lindsay you going first I haven't seen anything from Councillor Stannard yet, so yeah. um, yes, Councillor Lindsay. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Liz. I, actually, I'm not satisfied with the numbers behind the business case in this application uh, because, uh, for example, certain things have been excluded from the cost uh, the cost side. For example, the insurance of the um, the actual new building itself. And I propose that, it be, that this application be deferred in order that the numbers behind the business case can be clarified. 
do have a seconder. I'm just going to ask your next local member if you'd like to come in and make any comments before we go to your seconder. Councillor Ian Stanard. Um, I share many of the concerns that uh, have been expressed by those who have objected to the scheme. To me, we are not in a position tonight to make a decision because like Councillor Lindsay, I think there are some financial ambiguities that mean that I don't feel comfortable that a decision can be made this evening in the full knowledge of all the facts. So I'm not sure whether he wishes me to uh, second the motion of deferment. I'm happy to do so if that's the case um, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lindsay, you're waving your hand around. So I'm just saying, Yes, Ian can second it. Yes, that's fine. I think Claire would like to second it as well, but never mind. Um, I just want to get this clear at the moment because I see uh, Councillor Vickers and Councillor Ruth Fletcher. But then I'm going to go to the fact that it has been proposed and seconded um, to defer for further discussion on the finances, um, which we feel we can't cope with tonight. Um, am I misleading the... the um, no, no, that's I mean, correct. I, I, would, I would agree with that view. All right. Well, I, I, I've got three speakers. I'll bring them in. Unless there's any disagreement, we'll go to a vote on that. If there is disagreement, then obviously we'll discuss it. Councillor Claire Vickers. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I share the concern of the two local members um, about uh, the financial aspects, which we obviously can't discuss in open session. And I would absolutely support we defer this to get these... Um, uh, I's, dotties and T's cross, please. So I'm supporting a deferral. Thank you. Councillor Ruth Fletcher. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, not happy with the idea of deferring. Um, I think that simply deferring on grounds of finances will not um, resolve all the issues that need to be sorted uh, with this application. So um, I, I assume that the uh, the correct procedure here is to allow the original motion or the, the amended motion to defer um, to, to go through and then to debate um, the reasons why we need to uh, go beyond deferral in considering this. Um, however, if it's necessary to um, put forward yet another alternative of motion to refuse straight away I could uh, consider the, consider doing that but I'd rather hear other people's uh, um, views as well and um, so uh, I assume the correct thing to do is to debate the motion for deferral. Yeah can, can, can I just um, ask for complete clarity you yes. are you um, are suggesting that you would like to see a refusal put forward I'm, I'm suggesting that from what I've heard so far, that's what that's the way I'm, I'm currently minded. But I'd be very happy to hear other um, other views before um, moving to a vote on that. Right, thank you, uh, Councillor Colin Minto. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm happy to support the, the deferral as long as that gives us the opportunity to at the next sitting to talk about the visibility, uh, the, the visitability of it. I think there's a huge loss um, potential there if we cannot enable the, uh, the mill to be visited in the future. So happy to, to support the deferral if it still means that we can debate that, that critical issue. I'm fairly sure it does, but I'll get clarification for you before we go to a vote. Um, oh dear, lots of other hands are popping up here. I'll take people who haven't spoken before, so I'll go to Councillor Tony Bradman. Chairman, thank you. Um, it just seemed to me that as an historic building, you know, there's some, some way or other it should be retained as it is and we should be able, it should be possible and it's not beyond the wit of man, surely to uh, have it open to the public. Um, and I'm sort of mindful of the um, the other, which is the oldest windmill in the country, I think, which is out, Outwood. Mm -hmm. um, that's been on the market for some time, I think. And um, it seems to me that quite often people 
purchase these things and think, oh, this is going to be great. You know, we're going to live in this historic thing, this historic building. And then, then they find they can't afford to keep it or, you know, or really they just want it as a private residence and don't want the public coming round, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, which I think is a great pity. So I'm, I'm a bit uh, like uh, Councillor Ruth. I feel that it really is just deferring a refusal as far as I can see. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Christian Mitchell. Well, Chairman, I am very sympathetic to what um, Councillor Fletcher says and, and concurred by Councillor Bradnam. Um, however, um, whilst I think there probably is enough information to make a final decision today, um, I think on balance, uh, the local members are right to ask for a deferral for further information because, um, and this is only providing that it would come back to committee be that in January or even February, then all the information will be in to make a completely informed decision. Um, I suppose if um, if it were refused today, I, su I, I suppose I wouldn't want a procedural point on appeal to be made that um, the applicants could readily have provided that information. Pausing there, it's regrettable that the local members and the committee are finding that they're not with such information. But anyway, be that as it's said, um, I wouldn't want to find ourselves in an appeal where they could have provided that and they've felt um, that they haven't been diligent in doing that uh, and and then we've got unnecessary distracted so if it was coming back at the next committee meeting I don't see why it couldn't then I would support um, deferral um, but I, th I think um, Councillor Fletcher's um, it's a heart and a head decision I, I, I can see where she's coming from but I think a deferral probably on balance is right. Councillor Andrew Baldwin. Thank you, Chairman. I agree that this should be refused, but I do support the local officers wish for it to be deferred. So I will go along with deferral, but I hopefully eventually it gets refused. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll go back then to the last two speakers who have already spoken. I'll go first to uh, Councillor Claire Vickers and then Councillor Ian Stannard as a local <laughs> member to have the last word before we go for a vote. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Vickers. Thank you, Chairman. I, just to say that I think it's important that we have all the information we need to make a good decision on this. So that's the reason I'm want, wanting this deferred. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ian Stannard. Absolutely nothing that anyone said this evening is giving me rise to necessarily support this application. But following on from what Claire has said, it's important that the information we have is accurate. And if the, and, and there are serious financial concerns that we can't discuss now, which will become obvious. And one day I'm sure we'll be speaking about this again. Before I go back to Councillor Fletcher, I'm going to ask um, the officers if they'd like to come in before we um, decide how we're going to vote on this. I think um, we, we, Chairman, we just need to be clear what the motion is um, be, before a vote is taken. Um, obviously, Councillor Lindsay and Councillor Stannard um, raised the matter of the business case, but then further comments were raised in terms of um, uh, the ability of the public to to visit the listed building. So I think we just need complete clarity in terms of what Councillor Lindsay's motion is and, and, and what Councillor Stannard seconds before the vote is taken. Thank you. Councillor Lindsay, can you clarify that? Yes, I, th I think um, the in, in my opinion, the business case, given the extra information I've got, doesn't really add up. And if we don't have a business case to actually support keeping the bill open, then th then that that means that this proposal we can't really go ahead with it because there's no point. Because if it doesn't support the wind bill, then why do it? Councillor Ian Stannard, do you wish to? And yeah, that's entirely true. At the moment, the business case is flawed. The whole thing is therefore pointless. The conversation needs to end until we clarify the business case. Having heard that, um, Councillor Ruth Fletcher, do you still want to put your your um, counter proposal? Well, it's not a counter proposal, different proposal. Um, I I do want to just understand this. I, I still have I have really serious concerns about this, and. Um, 
I don't see that there's a um, inherently a problem in deferring if people feel that that's incredibly important to do. But I'm very worried about getting tripped up on procedural uh, niceties and, and discovering that if we defer on the basis of a business case that we've ended up in practice in um, conceding that, that we are in favour in principle of a development of this sort and I really wouldn't want to do that. So I'd like the officer's advice and if the officer's advice is that there's any risk that by deferring there is some form of um, acknowledgement of the acceptability of this proposal, I'd like to speak um, speak against it. Uh, that's absolutely fair enough. I'm just going to ask for the legal position on that. Um, legal. I, I, see, I see where Councillor Fletcher is coming from and I understand that we don't want, the committee doesn't want to be in a position where their hands are tied at the next meeting. However, there's been no proposal that if the business case is sufficient that we would actually approve it at the next meeting. So it's completely open-ended. So the only proposal before the committee is to defer the whole item to, and then for the business case to be put, and then, then the committee will have the opportunity of considering the proposal in full. And if the committee decides they don't want to go ahead with it, then they are free to do so. Just to get that, complete, just to get that completely clear, if the committee decide, having read the financial report in full, that they are st it's still open to them to refuse the application. Yeah. Chairman, a point of order. I think it's not just the business case. I think I think members want to be clear that they can debate all the other points in the report. Sure. I think that needs to be made clear. It's not just waiting for the business case, but we can't make a decision without a clear business case tonight. And that's why I support a deferral. But that shouldn't stop us debating all the other points on the uh, report at the next meeting. Thank you. On that basis, Councillor Fletcher? On that case, I, I, I shan't propose a, a, another alternative motion. Right, that's fine. Well, we have, they have the motion put forward by Councillor Lindsay, select, um, selected, um, mm. seconded by Councillor Ian Stannard. Um, are you all clear on what we're voting for? Mm -hmm. A deferral, but with a guarantee that when it comes back to committee, we are debating the entire situation and not just the financial side of it. Is that correct, um, Mrs. Solicitor? Yes, yes, uh, that is that is correct. That's, you haven't made a decision one way or, or the other on this application because you simply haven't had the, the financial information and other information that you need to do that. Right. So we've, you. you know, it's it's um, stopped at first base, and we'll deal with first base when we get further information, and then we will be able to look at the uh, ap application in the round with all the information that we need. Yeah. Right, that's lovely. I see the monitoring officers looking at us. Are you happy with that? Because I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that this is this is a um, a delicate situation. Uh, yes, Chairman, absolutely. Um, on a point of order with regard to the proposal to defer, it had been proposed and seconded, so therefore we, we had to take it to vote anyway. But it, it is good to flesh out um, you know, and clarify exactly what you will be looking at next time round. So that, that is it's helpful to the committee. So thank you, Chairman. Thank you. All right, then, um, Democratic Services, we'll go to the vote, if that's all right. If everybody's completely clear on what we're voting on. Yes, I get that from the nods. When you're ready. Okay, thank you. So this first vote is on application DC 20-0321 for deferral. Uh, Councillor Allen. Um, just before you do that, do we have to take the other one separately? Or yes, it, it would still be two separate that? votes. It will. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so Councillor Allen. For... Councillor Baldwin. For. Councillor Bevis. For. Councillor Bradnam. For. Councillor Britton. For. 
Thank you. Councillor Karen Burgess. Four. Councillor Roy Cornell. Four. Councillor Costin. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Fletcher. Four. Councillor Greening. Four. Councillor Haig. Four. Councillor Hogben. Four. Councillor Kitchen. Four. Councillor Landyu. Four. Councillor Lindsay. Four. Councillor Milne. Four. Councillor Minto. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Newman. Four. Councillor Potter. Four. Councillor Ritchie. Four. Councillor Skip. Four. Councillor Stannard. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. And Councillor Walters. Four. Thank you. That's 26 in favour, so that's unanimous. We'll move on to the second vote for DC 200322, also for deferral. Councillor Allen. Four. Councillor Baldwin. Four. Councillor Bevis. Four. Councillor Bradnam. Four. Councillor Britton. Four. Councillor Karen Burgess. Four. Councillor Cornell. Four. Councillor Costin. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Fletcher. Four. Councillor Greening. Four. Councillor Haig. Four. Councillor Hogben. Four. Councillor Kitchen. Four. Councillor Landyu. Four. Councillor Lindsay. Four. Councillor Milne. Four. Councillor Minto. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Newman. Four. Councillor Potter. Four. Councillor Ritchie. Four. Councillor Skip. Four. Councillor Stannard. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. And Councillor Walters. Four. Thank you. That is also unanimous four. Um, so it has been deferred. Thank you very much for that. Um, right, we'll now move on to agenda item uh, nine. Um, so when you're ready to present it, we'll get going. Thank it's you, Chair. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chair. So members may recall at its meeting in June, the application for a surfaced highway lay-by at the junction of East Street, Burnt House Lane and Lambs Green Road was delegated to the Head of Development with a review to re approval, subject to further discussions with the applicant and West Sussex County Council Highways with a view to finding a means of restricting public access to the lay-by. The proposed lay-by would facilitate off-highway parking in connection with a new below-ground wastewater pumping station for reasons connected with the ongoing operation of the pumping equipment and associated rising main. Whilst discussions with the applicant and West Sussex County Council highways have, been, have taken place and amended information submitted, the local member has requested that this application uh, be brought back to committee before a decision is made. So the application site... Um, is located at the junction of East Street, Burnt House Lane and Lambs Green Road and the application seeks planning permission to install the surface lay-by in the position marked in the red line, so in that location. Concerns have been expressed by local residents and Rusper Parish Council that an open lay-by may result in fly tipping and anti-social activities along with concerns being raised about the acceptability of the sight lines and the removal of a section of hedgerow. The advice from West Sussex County Council as a local highway authority is that as the land is within the highway verge, an application to stop up the lay-by by installing bollards such that the lay-by is available exclusively for use by Thames Water would not be supported. For this reason, the applicant has proposed to install the applicant has proposed to install bollards, not to install bollards to prevent public access and instead has submitted a plan showing that public re park parking restrictions, sorry, in the form of double yellow lines and signage with regard to 24 hour access being required to the lay-by would be installed along with signage relating to fly tipping. Officers consider that the scheme proposed proposing parking restriction and signage is satisfactory 
um, rather than stopping up the lay-by to discourage antisocial activities and is commensurate with the scale and nature of the development. Members should note that planning cannot control matters that are covered by other legislation such as fly tipping and antisocial behaviour. In terms of highway safety matters, West Sussex County Council has advised that inspection of collision data provided to them by Sussex Police from a period of the last five years reveals no recorded injury accidents within the vicinity of the site. Therefore, they had advised that there is no evidence to suggest the informal lay-by is or was operating unsafely or that the proposed formalisation of the lay-by as proposed would, not, would worsen any existing safety concern and that visibility appears comparable to that of uh, the existing lay-by. In addition, the council's landscape officer has raised no objection to the application providing the landscaping works, um, which include the planting of a nature, nature hedgerow, hedgerow along the western boundary in the site in this location, along with a native woodland planting area to the rear of the site, are implemented within the first planting season or as soon as practical, and that is recommended in condition number five. It is considered that the proposed parking restrictions and signage is an acceptable solution relative to the scale and nature of the scheme, the subject of this application, and therefore the application is recommended for approval, subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Thank you. Right, thank you for that. Well, we have um, six speakers on this item. Um, the first one is on video is Wayne Mott. tell you how the Lambsgreen community feel at the moment. Lambsgreen is a very, very small rural hamlet essentially comprising of one unspoilt rural country lane. The application site is at the entrance to this hamlet and the pumping station is now the first thing you see as you turn into our community. It is a shame that we will not benefit from this new infrastructure as it is an intermediate facility linking two larger communities. Despite our rural setting, Lambs Green Lane is often used as a cut through from the A264 at Faygate to Gatwick and Manor Royal, and we battle with a very high incidence of antisocial driving and litter, which we are left to pick up. For some reason, we also attract a higher than average incidence of fly tipping. Thinking about the bigger picture, planners are also working on a new service station with food retail off the Faygate roundabout. There is also a fast food outlet planned for the Cherry Tree Pub. Both of these sites are on the northbound A264 and will most certainly lead to drivers seeking out convenient sleepy little lay-bys so they can eat their convenience foods as they wait for their passengers to land at Gatwick. As a community, we are also at the very beginning of the Homes England consultation, which could see Crawley and Ifield extended right up to our boundary. I hope you can now appreciate why the prospect of a 21 metre lay-by at the entrance to our hamlet has generated such an adverse reaction from almost every Lambs Green resident. We are proud of our unsport community and we really feel like we are battling on several fronts to keep it that way. As I travel around Horsham, I see many well-designed, small, discreet, hatched pull-ins marked for ambulances, school minibuses and the like. Surely this is what we need here. A 75 square metre lay-by seems like such overkill. Councillors, please vote as necessary to force Thames Water back to the drawing board. There is space and opportunity around the site for a more sympathetic solution here, which will form the entrance to our hamlet forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, when you're ready, the, ne the next speaker is John Eichel. My name is John Eichel and our land borders the application site. I have serious concerns about the highway safety. The applicants have only submitted a one directional traffic movement plan from south to north. Why have they not included the most likely vehicle movement of north to south? Is it because the applicants know there is a restricted sight line to oncoming traffic? In the north to south case, please bear in mind that the driver is now 3.5 metres off the highway edge facing south, looking at a neighbouring wooden fence and hedge which protects a four metre wide stream. On exiting the lay-by, the driver will have no useful view of the oncoming traffic until the vehicle is approximately one third of the way across the 40 mile an hour road. Please also note there is no vision of the junction of the driver's rear view mirrors as he manoeuvres due to the vehicle body angle. Why has Highway seemingly ignored the photographic evidence supplied by the local residents? <coughs> 
These have all been uploaded into the planning portal online, namely in comments made by Charles and Lodge and Moonmakers. Also, the committee should be aware the roadside boundary hedge has been left off the site plan. The plan formed the basis for a highways desktop study. Had a site visit been carried out, the officer would have seen, surely, seen the site line implications. We feel the highways officer may have made their recommendation not knowing the obstruction division exists. The applicants and their contractors have recreated an informal parking area in East Street alongside the pumping station and are using it for vans and tankers for diesel filling their generators. There have been no problems with sight lines at this small area at a safer location and is preferred by the driver so far. Please refuse this application on highway safety grounds. Thank you for listening. Right. Thank you for that. The, ne the next speaker is, well, it's not speaker, is Duncan Bell, who's done a written statement, as I understand it. West, the West Sussex County Council consultation report said the proposal for the planning application was a desktop study and no officers were visiting the site. Firstly, there is no sight line when leaving the proposed lay-by in a southerly direction, no visibility at all for pulling out. The large area of hedging fencing needs to be removed, which is not on the part on part of the planning application, and I believe is owned by Charles Farm. The new application shows no parking 24 hours a day, seven days a week, double yellow lines and cameras. However, the applicant doesn't own this land, so it cannot be solely used for this purpose. How can the double yellow lines and cameras be enforced? The new plan outlines the planning application in red, yet the application is only for the lay-by. The red line on the new plan has been extended to remove trees, shrubs, fencing, etc. Yet part of the area property within the red line has recently been registered to Charles Farm. In the recent planning application, they have added no fly ticking signs, which was dismissed at the previous planning meeting. Earlier, West Sussex County Council consultation report said no works were to be undertaken until agreed and planning permission in place. However, Thames Water have excavated the area to the required depth already and have saw cut along the edge of the highway to receive the new curb line. This is deemed an offence as permission hasn't yet been granted. The original pull-in lay-by is not a constructed highways lay-by. This is an area that the postman has used to pull over on for the last 10 to 15 years. This area is adequate for a vehicle having to visit the pumping station and gives visibility to passing traffic. If we give permission for this lay-by area highlighted in red, then all we are, go are, going to, uh, are doing is giving a location for caravans, rubbish, waste to be deposited as a regular current. Thank you very, thank you very much. And now we have um, Phil Jameson. Uh, who's supporting it, who's on Zoom. So good evening, Phil. Well, I thought he was on Zoom. Current, um, Phil, you're currently muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? Hello, can you hear me? You can now. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Good evening, I'm Phil Jameson. I'm uh, a town planner speaking on behalf of Thames Water. The proposed development is part of a scheme that is being carried out by Thames Water to comply with the statutory obligation under the Water Framework Directive to provide environmental enhancements and improved water quality. The proposed labour is required to enable safe access to the adjacent wastewater pumping station Access is required for regular maintenance visits and surfacing, as well as for a tanker in the event of emergency circumstances, such as the, fa such as the failure of pumping equipment. Parking of vehicles in the highway adjacent to the pumping station, close to a highways junction, would result in an unacceptable safety risk to the public, highway users and Thames Water personnel. Since the previous planning committee, it's been confirmed that the highways authority cannot allow for the lay-by to be stopped up or bollarded. Following liaison with the Highways Authority, the proposals have been amended to incorporate double yellow lines and signage that will discover, discourage overnight parking 
and other antisocial uses. Uh, we would like to make the following points in support of the planning application. The proposed lay-by will replace an existing informal lay-by at the same location. The lay-by is relatively minor in scale and is at ground level only. The size of the lay-by is the minimum required to enable a tanker vehicle to manoeuvre safely on and off the highway, as shown on vehicle tracking information in, in the application submission. The Highways Authority are satisfied with the proposals on safety grounds. The proposals include a scheme of landscape planting that will provide effective visual screen into the closest residential property and will contribute to the enhancement of biodiversity. The wastewater pumping station is an essential part of the drainage infrastructure serving Rustburn and the surrounding area. Without the proposed lay-by, there will be an unacceptable risk of traffic accidents and we would urge you to accept your officer's recommendation and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, the next speaker is Hilary Murgatroyd who's also on Zoom, so good evening, Hilary. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening, everyone. Please accept my thanks for permitting me to speak on Thames Water's behalf in support of this planning application. My name is Hilary Murgatroyd and I'm Capital Delivery Communications Manager for Thames Water. I wanted to be here on behalf of the company to assure you that we fully appreciate the concerns raised by the proposed installation of the lay-by adjacent to our new pumping station, and to add that we would not be proposing this if we didn't think it was absolutely necessary. We need the lay-by solely for safety reasons alone. We're not seeking it purely for our own convenience, but because we have no other safe means of access. Parking on the road is unsafe both for our own operatives and also poses an accident risk for other vehicles. And this risk is just too much for us to take. The particular stretch of road just doesn't allow for safe parking at any time, night or day. The turn between East Street and Lambs Green Road is a blind corner and we've observed traffic moving through this area at high speed. At Thames Water, we have a duty to provide sewerage services in the locality and to ensure this is treated to the highest standards. And we've achieved this by the installation of the pumping station and the subsequent cessation of discharged, of, sorry, of treated discharges into the Baldhorns Brook. But we also have a duty to ensure all of our operations are carried out safely and that our assets and fleet vehicles do not pose any risk to operatives and the wider community. As my colleague said, the wastewater pumping station is an essential part of the drainage infrastructure serving the local community. Without the proposed lay-by, there does remain a risk of traffic accidents, and we would urge the committee to accept the officer's recommendation and grant the planning and grant planning permission in the interest of public safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the final speaker, not only on this um, item, but uh, this evening, um, you have the honour, Geoffrey Hussey, Rasper Parish Council, I should say. Jeff, you're still like, you're still muted. How's that? Yes, that's good. Thank you. Good evening, councillors. Um, yeah, Jeff Hussey, Rusper Parish Council. Um, I'll keep this fairly short because uh, I think uh, we fully endorse what uh, Mr. Mott, Mr. Oikel, and Mr. Bell have said in relation to this application. Um, so I don't want to repeat myself or themselves on this application at all. But Rusper Parish Council are now having serious concerns, and I'd say serious concerns, as to the road safety aspect that has recently been identified in relation to the sight line of the service vehicles leaving this site. They would have no view of oncoming traffic when traveling north to south, which is their preference when using their tankers to service the site. The vehicles would need to pull out right into the middle of the road for any view. The applicants have only shown northbound vehicle tracking and not the visibility display from traffic approaching south. I don't understand why that is. There has been no response from highways as regards to the road safety aspect, despite the submission of photographs, videos to them and requests for site visits on numerous occasions by Councillor Kitchen and myself. 
Given the dangers for vehicles exiting the site at this point, the parish council strongly feel that service vehicles are safer on the road for their infrequent visits and that the application should be refused. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you. Um, I'm sure the officers have some comments to make on this before I go to the local members. Thank you, Chair. If I could just pick up on a, a couple of the points mentioned. Um, so in terms of land ownership, um, members should note that the application um, is accompanied by ownership, ownership, ownership certificate D, which applies where the names and addresses of any of the owners of the pieces of land are not known. And at the time of submission of the application, the land was unregistered um, with both West Sussex County Council and um, Horsham District Council advising that they aren't the landowners. Um, and the implications of signing ownership certificate D is that the applicant is required to um, publish a copy of a notice in a local newspaper, in this case, a district post um, in March um, of this year. And a copy of that um, notice um, has been submitted in support of the application. Irrespective of that, however, the granting of planning permission doesn't affect um, an owner's right to retain or dispose of their property. Um, so if it was later found that the, the land was within the ownership of, of, of somebody else, um, then, then that issue could be taken up um, between the parties. Um, in terms of um, West Sussex County Council making a site visit, um, it is understood that they have undertaken a site visit as part of pre-application discussions um, with the applicant, and that was prior to submission of, of the current application. Um, so they, they have undertaken a site visit as, as far as we're aware. Um, in terms of enforcement of parking restrictions, as the lay-by um, is on the highway verge, it's my understanding um, and that irrespective of land ownership, that um, there would be a no waiting order made and as there would be double yellow lines, this is enforced by, by ourselves, the Horsham District Council on behalf, on behalf of West Sussex County Council. And um, members should note that there is some notes to applicant informatives um, that say that should planning permission be granted, that um, the applicant will need to contact West Sussex County Council traffic regulation order team um, to sort out the, 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 the relevant um, waiting restrictions. And also West Sussex County Council have advised that they want to um, agree the um, placement of the signage as well. In terms of visibility, um, paragraph 109 of the MPPF states that development should only be prevented or refused on highway grounds if there would be unacceptable impact on highway safety or the residual cumulative impacts on road network would be severe. So in this case, West Sussex County Council as the local highway authority have advised that they don't consider that the proposal would have an unacceptable impact on highway safety or result in severe um, impact on the operation of the highway network and therefore would not be contrary to paragraph 109 of the MPPF and officers um, don't consider that there would be um, a reason to take a different view in this case. However, if members um, did have concerns in respect of visibility, then um, we could uh, attach a condition requiring visibility displays to be agreed. Thank you. Right, um, Councillor Tony Hogburn. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you may remember this come to committee uh, around three months ago. Um, it was deferred for um, to look at grounds of highway safety to see what we could do with West Sussex C County Council in consultation to, uh, you know, we were hoping to maybe get bollards, hope, hope to redesign the lay-by, hoping to maybe get the lay-by made smaller. Um, Liz and I as local members have not been consulted at all on this. Um, we've chased, well, sorry, Liz, I, I'll give her a credit. Liz has chased this practically weekly. I've certainly seen four, five, six emails over the summer about this. Um, she's tried to speak to people and no one has consulted with us about it. Uh, deeply disappointed that we, we haven't particularly moved forward in the direction we wanted to. Um, this, this planet question has significant public objections. It has uh, the local council against it, the parish council against it, and 27 letters of objections. So this is significant um, objections to this scheme. Um, Duncan Bell is a respected HDV driver who owns a construction company that lives down the road. Uh, he knows what he's talking about when he talks about sight lines and driving large vehicles. Um, it's obviously disappointing to hear that West Sussex conducted a paperwork exercise. Um, 
I would class Duncan as, I'm going to say, an expert witness in, the, in, the, in this field. Um, you've heard comments that they feel that, that the lay-by is over mass. It's 21 metres long, 75 metres. It, it, it's huge. Uh, we have disputes around the ownership of the, of, of the land. Uh, particularly the grass verge, which has been removed in the uh, some of the drawings. Um, so whilst the grass verge might be, in order to get the sight lines, there are certain areas of trees, shrubs and, and sight lines, which are definitely um, under dispute of, of their ownership. So um, I appreciate the, um, the officer who just said that that, that, that could be a, a, a step going forward. Um, there are um, oil tankers. Um, what's disappointing, you may have heard the, 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 um, one of the residents comment the fact that most houses on the street are served by cesspits and septic tanks and are on oil. Um, Lands Farm is a rural community and doesn't have access to um, you know, gas and water and, and, and main sewage. Um, so they don't actually benefit the, the locals from, from this particular pumping station. and. and um, all of them, uh, myself included, I live in a rural community, we have oil tankers arriving once a month to deliver oil. And we have tanks emptying our, our, our septic waste. Um, they will park on a rural lane for 15, 20 minutes sometimes, filling up with their oil, fill it, filling away, put the double yellow lines on, and, and yes, they'll cause a, an obstruction, but the, the, the view from the parish council, the view from the people who live down that lane, that they are better off causing a, a slight obstruction um, to the road than trying to park off, off the site. Um, I understand that we can't have bars. I'm understanding that, 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 that you know, there is a, a verge and that because anyone can park on the verge, we've been informed that we can't install bollards on this particular lay-by because there was never bollards there and my Sussex County Highways won't support that, which, which again is um, disappointing. Um, I, I worry about precedent being set. If someone wants to build a lay-by, I mean, I'd love to build a lay-by outside the front of my house. I live on a rural road. Um, I have an oil tanker once a month. I have a, I have a cesspit empty once a month. Um, can I have a lay-by, please? Um, it, it's, uh, um, so we have significant objections. Uh, there is a tricky around planning um, reasons um, and significant harm. Um, what is the planning grounds to object this? We deferred it last time, hoping to resolve the issue. And I said, deeply disappointed that, that no one has consulted with, with myself and Liz and that we haven't moved forward. So, uh, but, but the planning grounds, um, I'm going to go with unnecessary development, the lack of need. Um, you know, once a month, an emergency access is not frequent enough to build a lay-by of that size, uh, a concrete mass um, of that size of development for... Um, limited emergency access, it just, it's just not frequent enough in my, in my opinion. The, the, the level of public objections, um, and I'd love to object on grounds of road safety, um, bearing in the fact that I've got you know, 28 people disagreeing on, on grounds of road safety, but I, I appreciate that's a tall order uh, to get through. So I, I'll listen to the debate on this item, but um, I suspect I'd like the, uh, the chairman to come back to me and I probably will be proposing um, after listening to the debate carefully, um, I refuse in this motion. Thank you, Chairman. Before, as the other local member, I come in, I see that I've got um, the Head of Development's hand up. Do you want to come in before me, Emma? You're welcome to if you want to. I, I don't mind. Depends what you're going to say, Chair, but um, I, I don't <laughs> mind. I can come in now. Um, um, just, just I wanted to make a, a couple of comments. Um, with regard to the points just raised, um, the facility here was was um, constructed under permitted development rights and, and, and is essential infrastructure required. Um, I agree with Councillor Cobb Hobben. It's disappointing we weren't able to achieve bollards, um, which was discussed at, at the, the previous committee meeting. Um, this is not possible because the county highways would have to create a stopping up order and, and they were were that it's not something that they were prepared to support so we we put forward a, a scheme that that we think is reasonable having consulted with the applicants um the applicants have submitted information related to to, to the essential need for the size um of of the lay by um with regard to, to tracking plans um and and matters of land ownership are, are, are not a planning matter it's not something we can can consider um i i, I find it very difficult 
to, to see how we could substantiate an argument in terms of unnecessary development and lack of need um, on the basis of, of the need for, for vehicles to pull off the public highway and in the absence of, of any concerns raised from, from the county highway engineer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask if I, I'm a bit disappointed because I was under the impression that some of the speakers were going to um, put videos up showing what the actual situation is at the moment. I, I don't know why that didn't happen, whether it wasn't possible or not. But can I ask, please, for the photograph that you showed in the first um, thing of Lambs Green Lane? Amy, could we have that? So you can actually see what a rural situation that is. Um, I have no problem at all. Well, I can't, I don't have a problem because there isn't one about permitted development for this, for the um, building that's there. But if you look from that um, telegraph pole or electricity pole or whatever it is, down to the, the you can just see the, the entrance to um, Charles, uh, that land is not in the ownership of the, of the applicant. And it's completely unnecessary to have that size of lay-by there. And I, I feel that we are, as a planning authority, we're being asked to authorise the lay-by. And just looking at that, surely you can see it's in a rural community and the lay-by itself just doesn't, doesn't fit in. It takes away the, the rural area of it. And I don't believe that the applicants have, have demonstrated that the, the need for it. Uh, plenty of cars and vans and lorries and things parked down there anyway. You, you can, you've seen them in, in the things that come in. And I'm sorry, I cannot support this. And it's purely on, on, on the rural area and concreting over it. I'm sure there are better people who can put that in, in other terms. But to me, they can have their pumping station there, which is necessary, which is up between the signpost and the, and the, um, the chevrons there. You do not need that, that amount of lay-by. You maybe need a bit, but certainly not that size of lay-by. And I, I'm having listened to the argument and debated it, I simply can't support it. And I agree with um, my fellow member that it's, it was absolutely ridiculous that the highways wouldn't talk to us so we could discuss this. The, there's a site just a little bit further down the road towards Ifield where they put up cameras for fly tipping and lack of fly tipping. And the first thing the fly tippers did was to steal the cameras. So quite, you know, which the Horsham people are fully aware of <laughs> and annoyed by. But, you know, cameras and double yellow lines in a rural area like this just don't make a slightest bit of difference. And so I, I have to say, I agree with um, my fellow member. I completely oppose this. And I'd like to ask other members to do the same. I'm going to ask, have to ask for you now to take the screen ceiling away because I can't see who's asking to speak. But I see the next one is, Car is Councillor Karen Burgess. Councillor Burgess, when you're ready. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yes, I totally agree with all that's been said, including um, lots of the comments made by Councillor Tony Hogburn, who put it across very eloquently and forcefully, I feel, at times, and I think that's what we need to do. What disappoints me more than anything else is yet again, highways feel it's not necessary to consult people. Um, they've got a bit of a track record for this. Um, I can think of lots of examples where this has happened. Um, and as the vice chairman of this committee, I should have been along with you, chairman, and the other local member uh, consulted on this. We haven't been. Um, the silence has been absolutely deafening on this. Um, the lay-by size is massive. And I think, as one of the objectors stated, it's quite easily going to be used as people who are travelling um, to pick up people from Gatwick as a sort of a stop-off point. It's certainly big enough to fit at least two or three cars in there. Um, I would agree with you. I won't be going for this one either. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Christine Costin. Unmute. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
I listened to the, the local people objecting and I, I felt absolute sympathy for them. It's such a nasty intrusion on their lives, um, which is not necessary. I mean, we looked at it, it's just not necessary. And it's high time that people took notice of local people who know that area so well. And I mean, and, and not only that, the local members know that area so well. And West Sussex County Council should be referring to them. They haven't done. And that's just not right. I mean, these poor people, it's just not just not right. I mean, it's not even anything that's connected with their own living environment. It's necessary, yes, but you know, the water work part is necessary, but the lay-by, it just seems outrageous. So I, I don't think we should support this application. Councillor Ruth Fletcher. Thank you. Um, I'm slightly confused in that um, West Sussex County Council ha have basically said there's no um, highway safety issue with the proposal. They've said there's no highway safety issue with the current situation pre the pumping station. So how can we be obliged to um, pass a planning application based on there being an overwhelming highway safety issue with the pumping station being there when there is nobody who has said um, that there would be a, an overwhelming safety issue by not having a lay-by? Right, I'll, I'll bring the officers in. I've got three more speakers and then I'll bring the officers back to answer your question. Councillor Claire Vickers. Yes, Chairman, I share the disappointment expressed by the Head of Planning and you and your um, other local member. This is the first time I've ever um, had to deal with a lay-by planning application. I remember it being deferred to try and get bollards, which would have helped considerably. Um, I'm at a loss as to know how we go about getting a refusal on this. I, maybe we can get um, a suggestion, but I do share the disappointment that um, West Sussex don't seem to be uh, engaging. Thank you. I bring the final two speakers in on this. Uh, Councillor Colin Minto. Thank you, Chair. I totally agree with all the, the local members and, and all the other sentiment. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I heard that they'd already started work there um, and uh, started, started excavating. I, I don't know whether that, that is the case or not. And if so, I think that's, that's totally unacceptable before we've even had the, the benefit of, of voting on this. Um, I too would like a recommendation from officers on, on what grounds we can refuse this. Uh, there's so much objection to it. Um, it doesn't sound like it's, it's, it's necessary. Um, going back to what Councillor Hogman said, if this is only a once a month occurrence, surely uh, road signage can be put out, traffic calming, when the, the lorry's there for the short period of time, um, which completely negates having to do a massive piece of, uh, of infrastructure development. I'm going to use Chairman's prerogative here, but as a local member, I'm going to say that, 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 that half the work, if not more, is already done. Um, so, you know, that in itself isn't good. Anyway, I'll go back to the, la the last speaker on this and then ask the officers to come in to answer the questions formally. Councillor David Skip. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I drive on this road at least twice a week. Um, you're absolutely right. The work has been done up, up at the end of it anyway. Um, I've never seen any problems with this road. Um, putting in a lay-by of this size probably is going to create more problems on that road with vehicles also pulling out to uh, access the, the turning at the end. Um, there is a blind corner anyway coming down from, from Rusper, which isn't going to be... Um, affected by the, um, by the uh, lay-by. I think putting signs up and putting um, double yellow lines is an absolute waste of time and is not gonna have any effect whatsoever um, on people who wanna go and use that lay-by or park in it. Um, and, and there is always dumping um, a, around those roads. And, and personally, I think that if highways can't really come and, and, and look at it, um, I think the, the residents are absolutely right. It'd be much better to leave well alone when the vehicles come, and, and I've not seen many vehicles parked on that strip of road, 
um, it is easy to to um, drive around them or wait. Uh, and I think this is totally unnecessary. So I'd, I'd like to hear how we can refuse it uh, on, uh, and on what grounds. I'm not sure the officers can tell you how you can refuse it, but can you answer some of the questions, please? Um, thank you, Chairman. I probably will bring in my legal colleagues as well, if, that, if that's OK, Chairman, um, because I just, just want to remind members um, why we deferred it um, at the last meeting. It was that obviously that the, the, the item was debated and, and the resolution was to defer it in terms of um, seeking to restrict public access. Now, obviously, that's not been achievable. So that's something for members to consider. Um, it wasn't deferred because members considered that the lay-by was too large and it wasn't deferred because members considered that the impact of the lay-by was harmful to the character and appearance of the area. So we do need to be mindful of consistency in decision making here. Um, and I would just like to bring my legal colleagues in just to, to provide a view on that, please. Legal colleagues. <laughs> um, can, can I go first? Do you think, Chair? Yes. Yep. Um, cool. 1.1 1 .1 of the report says that at the meeting, the application was delegated to the head of development with a view to approval subject to further discussions with the applicant and WSEC with a view to finding a means of restricting public access to the lay-by in consultation with local members and the vice chairman of the committee. And what's happened since that meeting is that the most effective way of preventing the public to have access is the bollards and that hasn't been approved by WSCC. They, they won't do the stopping up order. So that's really, you, you were minded to approve, but you did want to be um, assured on that point. You have not been assured on that point. And I think that would be your reason for refusal. I think the other reason regarding um, the effect on the rural character, that's really, a new reason, and I don't think really that should be brought forward. I think it's simply um, tying up the ends and finding that the solution that you were seeking hasn't actually worked. Uh, uh, I don't know if the monitoring officer wants to um, add anything to that, because I think she's, um, she might want to add to what I've said. You know, that, that, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Make sure she's still there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Hogden, are you, go, are you prepared uh, to make that? Uh, I'm still slightly unclear, as I'm sure some of my colleagues are, on the exact grounds for refusal, but uh, uh, we've been unable to secure um, restricted access to this lay-by. Um, I don't know how we word that, but uh, I'm unhappy on grounds of, of, of uh, uh, but dare I say, it, road safety and uh, community safety that we've been unable to secure uh, restricted access to, to, to the lay-by. And I don't know how to word that, and I'd appreciate some, uh, some advice. Thank you. Um, the difficulty is, Councillor Hogburn, is, is I don't think it's a reasonable reason for refusal, um, unfortunately. Um, I, I just think, you, you know, that, that was effective the only matter that that members considered needed further consideration at the last meeting and so I think it, it's difficult to raise any new ones but that in itself in my view is very difficult to substantiate on planning grounds because the main concern relating to restricting access was to stop fire tipping and things like that which in itself is an illegal activity and planning should not be used to control types of development which are controlled by other legislation and so therefore I think if I may the reason you're finding it tricky is 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 because it's very difficult to substantiate any concerns on planning grounds you know you you can refuse it in terms of um is not being able to demonstrate that that the lay by um access to the lay by could be restricted and therefore would result in impacts on fly tippy etc but as I said I think you'd be in a very tricky situation in appeal if, if you were to move forward on that basis. Thank you. 
as I understand it, um, not wanting to put words into your mouth, Tony, as I understand it, you were saying it was because we couldn't achieve the bollards um, would be grounds for refusal, the only grounds for refusal tonight. And if it did come to um, an appeal, which it probably will, um, then other members can put up their members, not the local members can put up their, their, their grounds. But in our case, it's because we couldn't achieve the bollards. Is that how you see it? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, obviously, I feel back into a corner. I mean, there are, uh, you know, there is unnecessary development, lack of need that the proof for once a, a month access would, 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 would appear uh, you know, a lack of need in my opinion, and um, it's been suggested that you know, lay by of that size is harmful to the visual impact of the community. So there are several possible planning reasons. Um, I, I obviously, you know, hear the officers' advice that to backtrack almost. Um, I, I, I recollect that that meeting there were significant objections that we were happy to resolve through consultation, and we have been, been unable to resolve them through consultation. So. Um, I'm going to actually suggest that, that we do put forward uh, unnecessary development, lack of need, and that the lay-by is harmful to the visual impact of the community, and that we have been able to, uh, un not able to restrict access um, as, re um, as, um, as required. I would suggest we put the restrict access first, but yes. I've okay, got two <laughs> three reasons, and I appreciate that that's possibly against the officer's recommendation, but they're the three reasons I'd like to put forward. Well, we've got two other speakers, and then I'm going to draw this to a conclusion. Um, Councillor Colin Minto. And, and just to support that, once, once we have identified the, the grounds for refusal, can we also uh, put in an insistence that no further work is carried out on that site? Um, I'm not sure whether um, we can actually ask them to, um, to put things right and back to, to normal state, but I think it's totally unacceptable that before planning has been approved that someone goes ahead and starts the works. So if that can be included, I would appreciate it. Thank you. If I can just comment on that, it's not something we can include within a reason for refusal, but after the meeting, I can certainly refer the matter to our enforcement team in terms of any further action that may be necessary. Thank you, I, I would appreciate that. I think interestingly, as a side in the um, highways uh, instructions to the applicant at the very beginning of all this, it said that no work was to be started before that uh, the written permission of the highways. And as I understand it, they've never had that, but the work has been carried out. Now I accept fully that, that a lot of the work is permitted development. It's the other bits that have gone on that, that, that's caused irritation to the, local population and to those of us who, who live in the area. Right, final spe speaker on this before we go to the vote is Councillor Ruth Fletcher. Thank you, it's just picking up again on the, 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 the question I was really asking before and in support of uh, Tony Hogman's comments about the, the harm of this to the visual character and so on, which uh, fly tipping and, uh, and caravans would cause, um, that, as far as I can see, the highways have spoken by saying there's no, un, no uh, unacceptable impact on highway safety um, of the proposal. There's no unacceptable impact on highway safety of the situation prior to the um, pumping station. So I don't understand why we um, a claimed unacceptable impact on highway safety uh, by the applicant, which hasn't been commented on by West Sussex, is pushing us towards a development that is causing a harm. Okay, so... Can I, can I just, sorry, Chair, can I just make a suggestion in terms of Councillor Hogman's comments and Councillor Fletcher's? Um, to sum it up, it, it does appear to be that members are of the view that the benefits do not outweigh the harm. And, and so I think, and, and that's summed up in terms of what Councillor Hobbin said in terms of the inability to restrict access, um, the, cons the fact that it's considered to be unnecessary and a lack of need, it's been considered that the, the benefits don't, don't outweigh the harm. So, so I think that that can, can form a, a, a draft reason for refusal with the details as mentioned by Councillor Hob Hobbin. Right. Councillor Hobbin, are you happy to propose that? 
Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I have one other comment at the bottom, and that was the note to the applicant that uh, should this go through, it was a note that they should apply for a, a regulation for TRO for double yellow lines. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm hoping this doesn't go through. I'm hoping it doesn't go through on appeal. But uh, should that not be a regulatory condition? That, that I mean, again, we, if, if, if this is minded to refuse and, and my refusal is supported, then um, I'm happy for that to go through. But if, if, if the motion was to fail for refusal, I'd, I'd very much like to see um, a regulatory condition um, added that the, the applicant must submit a TRO and, and that the application is only approved subject to the TRO going through. Could, could I come in there, Chair? Um, it was subject to a Section 106 agreement, I believe, which would require them to do a TRO. That was my understanding of the application. I'm not sure, but this could be irrelevant. Shall we um, just take the vote first? Um, you have proposed, I, I, I will second your proposal. And can we take a vote on that? Um, and then we'll come back if the vote is lost. Okay, so um, Democratic Services, are you ready to go through our names again? <laughs> yep, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so this is a vote for refusal of this application as it has been unable to sure. secure restricted access to the lay-by and there is a lack of need for the lay-by and the benefits do not outweigh the harm it would bring. So, Councillor Allen. Abstain. Councillor Baldwin. Four. Councillor Bevis. Four. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam. Uh, I'm not voting. I had to leave the room. Okay. Uh, Councillor Britton. Councillor Britton. Four. Thank you. Councillor Karen Burgess. Four. Councillor Cornell. Four. Councillor Costin. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Against. Councillor Fletcher. Four. Councillor Greening. Four. Councillor Hay. Four. Councillor Hogben. Four. Councillor Kitchen. Four. Councillor Landyu. Four. Councillor Lindsay. Councillor Lindsay. Sorry, four. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Councillor Milne. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Minto. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Newman. Four. Councillor Potter. Abstain. Councillor Ritchie. Four. Councillor Skip. Four. Councillor Vickers. Abstain. And Councillor Walters. Four. Thank you. So that is 19 for, one against, and five abstentions. So that motion has been carried, the refusal, that is. Right, so that is refused. Thank you very much. I think we can leave it there then, um, Councillor Hogman. Right. Um, as I don't believe that we've got no speakers on the next two items on the agenda, I I'm plan to go ahead unless I get a lot of people saying they'd like a, a five minute break. But I think um, if you're all happy with that, we'll go ahead. OK, in that case, we'll move on to the next agenda item 10. Thank you, Chair. So this application proposes the erection of a bin store to accommodate six 1,100 litre communal general waste bins for the use by residents of Burton's Court. The application is before members as the, applica as the applicant is Horsham District Council. So the bin store is required as a permanent bin storage uh, solution for the flat since the new Piri's Place car park was constructed. The bins were previously stored inside the old car park. The bin store, um, would replace an existing temporary storage arra arrangement, as can be seen on the plan, and would be located in between the, the gap between the two Burton Court blocks fronting onto Parkway. 
So the application site is located between the two blocks that make up Burton's Court, a residential building comprising 32, 33, sorry, one and two bedrooms flats. The site fronts onto Parkway and is visible from the road. So the bin storage area would go in this location here. So the proposals have been significant, significantly amended from the originally submitted plans to overcome concerns um, in respect of the appearance and amenity impacts. The bin store, as now proposed, would be constructed in brick to match Burton's Court with a gently sloping green roof. The store would measure to a maximum height of 2.7 metres, sloping down to 2.2 metres, and would have a, a curved design to its north and south elevations. The store is proposed to have double gates at the front with a key code lock which would be accessible by residents and the council's collection operatives only. An access path would be located to the front elevation connecting to the existing footway. So a scheme of planting and landscaping is proposed in the grounds surrounding the bin store, including several climber plants and other shrub planting, along with two small flowering trees. Low level post and rail fencing to match the existing would be used to enclose the surrounding landscaped areas. So since the redevelopment of Piri's Place, bin storage has been temporarily placed within the alleyway between Parkway and Park Place adjacent to the building. This arrangement is unsightly and proposes a health and safety risk to the public. The removal of the bins in this location will be a benefit to both the appearance and health and safety of the publicly accessible alleyway, as well as a benefit to the amenities of residents in the flats immediately adjacent. The proposed bin store will provide a purpose-built, enclosed, lockable and easily accessible location for, lo uh, for communal bins for the residents of Burton's Court. It's acknowledged that the location of the bin store will partially obscure a near nearby window, resulting in a level of harm with regard to outlook of the resident of that ground floor flat. However, this harm has been mitigated as far as possible in the re revised design. Given the enclosed design of the bin store, the Council's environmental health officers have confirmed that no significant concern is raised with regard to neighbouring amenity in terms of noise or odour impact, providing that a robust bin storage man management plan is submitted to secure regular cleaning. No objections have been received to the amended application with no objections received from the occupiers of Burton's Court and therefore, for the reasons outlined in the report, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Francis Haig. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the officer gave a good summary of the situation that's faced by the Burton Court residents. Uh, unfortunately, the original bin store for them was located in Piri's Place car park and they have had two years of the bins being sited in an alleyway. It is untidy, it is, um, attracts uh, vermin, it has been an absolute nightmare for them and um, some residents have been affected by that particularly because their windows open right out by that, by that site. This is not an ideal solution. It's much better than we've had, they've had for the last two years. It would have been better if the bins could have been recited in the new car park. We've effectively given priority to car parking spaces rather than the residents and the need for their waste disposal. I, I, I suspect um, Councillor Fletcher will say more about the mix of the bins because really there should be more bins than are available. And it means that we do have to take particular care to uh, get the bins cleared weekly and not fortnightly, and also to keep the site tidy. But otherwise, uh, you know, we, we've got there at last. It, I just hope it won't take too long to be built out. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Belinda Walters. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I can only add, well, I can only sort of uh, confirm my support for this. Um, it isn't ideal, um, but previously, uh, when the bins were down Park Place, they uh, regularly overflowed, and I think it's upon HDC to make sure that these are managed uh, well. Um, the residents of these properties do... Um, have, because I think they've got kids and families, so they do have um, a higher amount of uh, waste to move on. 
than um, sort of typical um, areas. So I think as soon as, if we can get this in as soon as possible and it's managed correctly, then it's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ruth Fletcher. Thank you very much. Absolutely. As my fellow councillors have said, it's it, it really is time that we, we sorted it out. The current situation has been appalling for, for the, the various residents. Um, they are very, very keen to get this sorted out as quickly as possible. Uh, they're also keen to be able to start recycling something they've not been able to do as of now. And I've had um, requests that the bins are clearly labelled in the bin store and that residents of the flats are leafleted in advance about the new recycling arrangements so that they don't fail due to people putting um, recycling into the mixed bins and also that the uh, use of the recycling bin is monitored because the proposal is to have um, only one recycling bin, which is probably a good idea to start with as it's trialled, but assuming recycling works, and um, that like other residents, there will need to be a much higher proportion of recycling bins to normal bins. One of the reasons that, as Councillor Haig mentioned, this isn't sat entirely satisfactory is that um, there is only enough capacity in those bins for an estimated one week's worth of rubbish. And so the bins will need to be emptied weekly and that <coughs> needs to be kept a, a close eye on. So, again, I'd like this to be form part of the bin management plan that needs to be approved under the condition and to make sure that the dropped curb is installed um, before um, the, the building is, is put into service. Um, but I'm very keen to see this go ahead as soon as possible. Thank you. I've got two other speakers on this. Um, Councillor Brian Donnelly. Well, it's obviously a boo-boo was made probably 20 years ago when they were put in the car park in the first place. There should have been proper arrangements closer to the flats from day one but anyway that is history and i do recollect this coming up in the local economy pdag and i know that the town pdag have spent a long time trying to come up with a solution for what is clearly a very very difficult problem i agree with previous speakers about the number of collections in fact i would probably go and say that we should perhaps do weekly collections but all the all the six, six, can, can we stick with planning reasons? Well, this is a planning reason, in the sense that it's got to be approved. And can we approve it if it's a proper regime? Which is obviously not. Others have already mentioned that they're concerned about the number of bins. What I'm saying is that collect weekly and just collect general waste. Now I know that's a bit that's a bit uh, <laughs> sacrificial to say what's the word put the recycling and the other stuff in the one set of bins. What I'm saying then is, and you can hear it from three other members, you're then going to give the residents the ability to empty those bins regularly. But I just pass it as a suggestion. What, what I do feel strongly about is in Paris 6, 7, it talks of the management of the bin store will be the responsibility of HSDC. And similarly in Paris 6, 10, it says that details how HDC will ensure the store is kept clean, tidy and pest free. Well, I'm sorry. That's a civic responsibility of the users of the bins. And if they're not given that responsibility, they'll probably, oh, no, I don't want to say they'll make a mess, but who knows what will happen. So I really do think those two paras should be changed to, instead of the responsibility of HBC, HTC, it should be the responsibility of the management agents of Burton Court, which happens in all sites. There's no reason why Horsham should take on something for which uh, at the moment we, we were struggling to balance the books anyway so we don't need any more work in that sort of area thank you uh, chairman and the last speaker on this is councillor claire vickers uh chairman the um the comment i was going to make is similar to the one that's just previously been made i just want to know why we have to continue to maintain um look after them i, I would have thought the flats would have had a management company looking after their site and that should be part of their responsibility. I support the recommendation. I just want to know why we have to do the ongoing maintenance, that's all. I have, Thank to, you. Agree. I have to agree with you on that, but I equally don't understand why it's a planning um, comment. I see I've got Councillor Christine Costin, if you could be brief on this, Councillor Costin. Yes. Unless um, you have a different... Um, well, I, I was just going to say that historically, there have been a lot of difficulties with the rubbish 
that has been coming out of Burton Court. Somehow, um, the housing association involved with that needs to take more trouble in educating its residents. But it has been an awful problem in the past. And if we can just get them underway, but they do need help education wise. And I mean, meanwhile, obviously, we don't want it all spilling out onto um, the street, onto part way, because that would be rather nasty. But fully understand it shouldn't be Horsham District Council's responsibility. It should be the Housing Association. That's fine. Can I just bring this back, though, to planning? I and mean, I agree with what you're saying, but that's not what we're here for this evening. Um, before we take a vote on this, can I ask if the planning officer would like to make any comments, particularly on, on, on the, um, the lines in the report about Horsham being responsible for it? You keep jumping around and I keep losing you. Is it going to be Emma or Amy who's talking on this? Uh, well, I'll, I'll just come back on a, a couple of other points that were mentioned. So um, condition four um, re requires a bin storage management plan to be submitted and approved. And the idea of the management plan um, is that it would contain all relevant details relating to the ongoing maintenance of the store, um, bin collection frequency, um, and also liaison with residents and issues such as, um, you know, ongoing maintenance and repairs um, of the bin store. Um, and things such as the labelling of the bins and, and communication with residents about the new arrangements um, could be included in, in that bin management, bin storage management plan. And then um, to pick up on the point of, about the ratio of um, refuge to recycling bins, um, if members considered it necessary, um, condition nine could be amended to require at least one refuge bin and at least one recycling bin um, to allow more flexibility in demand in the future and um, that that flexibility and that demand could be monitored through the through the bin storage management plan um, and how the ratio of, of the different bin types um, would would be changed in the future I'm not sure if someone else can pick up on the um, the the ownership issue Ultimately, a planning permission runs with the land, so it, it becomes the responsibility of a landowner to, 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 to manage the conditions. But clearly there needs to be a conversation with HDC as de, as applicant and, and um, the, the, the operator managing the flats in terms of longer term management and maintenance. I, I think that falls outside of the, the conditions proposed today. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Donnelly. Well, can I thus propose that para 67 and para 610 be changed where it says HDC, we put in there management agents of Burton Co Court. In other words, take this responsibility to ensure the cleanliness of it away from the district council and put it where it rightly belongs. Anybody want to second that? I just want to ask Emma if that is in the remit of a planning committee. It, it's not it's, it's in the report so it's in the report but it's not within the resolution so i think um you know i, I think it, it can always be noted in the minutes but but it doesn't form part of the resolution uh, which which is the key bit for members to consider um and and i think it's something as i said that can pick, be picked up outside of planning committee right i propose then it is placed in the resolution i uh, pick 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 picked up as as a, a comment after the after we've agreed the application, I think we can no note it in the minutes. But it, but it wouldn't. It, I, I suggest we don't amend the resolution because it's not in the resolution at the moment. But but if members considered it necessary, we can note it in the minutes. Well, I agree. I therefore propose we note that uh, HDC is not responsible for the uh, the uh, the uh, management of the bin store. The responsibility is the uh, the managing agent of Burton Court. So, what would you be? Uh, are you, are you suggesting? Can we put this in in as a note after we've agreed the planning application? No, we agree that within the the resolution, as I already said. So it becomes part of the approval. Right. No, no difficulty in put it into the resolution. I think you are making a set, um, I'm looking for support here from the legal people. Um, I think you're making a separate um, request for, for, for a separate area on onto this. Is, 
And if that's the case, do you have a seconder? Um, but have I got that correct? Um, could, I, could I come in here? Yes, uh, please. Um, the recommendation is to approve the planning commission subject to appropriate conditions. Uh, the member has um, how you highlighted there's an issue in the report, which is inaccurate and or does not reflect uh, the responsibilities of HDC correctly. Mm. Uh, that can be dealt with in the minutes by noting that the particular paragraph, uh, it was noted that it wouldn't be the responsibility of HDC, but the responsibility of the management agent. And that then deals with that uh, because the report itself is, isn't the recommendation. It is not the approval. The, the, re the approval is the approval subject to the condition. Mm -hmm. We don't need to alter any yeah. We don't need to alter the recommendation. No. We simply yeah. need to note yeah. that uh, yeah. we don't yeah. agree with the particular paragraph in the report. Mm. Right. Yep, that's fine, Chairman. Okay, so we all know, just to be clear, we so much for saying this wouldn't take long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so we're, we're agreeing that we, we are agreeing with the recommendation as printed on the agenda for agenda item 11, but with a, with a recommendation in the minutes, Councillor Donnelly, as you have requested. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so let's take the recommendation first and then, then yeah. just be sure that we're going with the with what should go in the minutes. Are you all happy with that? Mm -hmm. All right, democratic services, here we go again. Thank you. Um, so this is a vote for the recommendation um, as printed in the report, which is to approve this application. Um, <laughs> Councillor Allen. Four. Councillor Baldwin. Four. Councillor Bevis. Four. Councillor Bradnam. Four. Councillor Britton. Four. Councillor Karen Burgess. Four. Councillor Cornell. Four. Councillor Costin. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Fletcher. Four. <laughs> Councillor Greening. Abstain as I lost connection. Thank you. Councillor Hay. Four. Councillor Hogben. Four. Councillor Kitchen. Four. Councillor Landyu. Four. Councillor Lindsay. Four. Councillor Milne. Four. Councillor Minto. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Newman. Four. Councillor Potter. Four. Councillor Ritchie. Four. Councillor Skip. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. And Councillor Walters. Four. Thank you. So that's 24 4, 0 against, and one abstention. So that's been approved. Thank you very much. And the minutes will note the comments from Councillor Donnelly, which I think everybody agrees with. Right. So we go on to the final one now, and you'll see why it's on the agenda. Um, whoever's presenting that. Thank you, Chair. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Um, so this application seeks permission for the erection of a rear extension to a mid-terrace property on Churchill Way in Broadbridge Heath. And the application is before members as the applicant is an officer of the council. Um, so the application site is situated between Churchill Way and the A264 within the built-up area of boundary of Broadbridge Heath. And the property is part of a close that consists largely of terrace properties of a similar form and design. The application site contains a two-storey mid-terrace dwelling with its front elevation facing northeast in the direction of the A264 and the application seeks permission for the erection of an extension to the rear elevation as shown in red. Boundary treatment around the rear of the property consists of close bordered timber fencing. So the extension will measure some three metres um, in depth by 3.7 metres in width and provide extended living accommodation with doors opening out into the rear garden area. The extension will have a glazed pitch roof with a brick, 
brick, plinth and glazing above. The materials proposed are brick to match the existing um, facing brick of the host property with UPVC double glazed um, windows, doors and the roof being finished in grey. It'll have an eaves height of 2.2 metres and a ridge height of 3 metres. So just turning to some photos, these show the rear of the property with the proposed extension sitting in the position of the existing patio doors, so in this area, and the neighbouring properties and the relationship of the extension with these properties can be seen in the photos. No objections have been received to the application and therefore the, for the reasons outlined in the report, the application is recommended for approval subject to the conditions as set out. Thank you. Councillor Matthew Allen. Thank you, Chairman. I'm quite happy to support the uh, recommendation in the report. And Councillor Louise Potter. Thank you. Likewise, I, I'm very happy to support this. Thank you. I don't see any hands up. So do we have to go through the list again? I think we do, don't we? Yes, unfortunately, Chairman, because we're virtual, we have to go through it all again. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. OK, Joe, when you're ready. I'll do it backwards <laughs> next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this vote is for the recommendation in the report to approve the planning application. Councillor Allen. For. Councillor Baldwin. For. Councillor Bevis. For. Councillor Bradnam. For. Councillor Britton. For. Councillor Karen Burgess. For. Councillor Cornell. For. Councillor Costin. <coughs> Councillor Costin. She's left. Ah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Donnelly. Oh. Councillor Fletcher. Oh. Councillor Greening. Oh. Councillor Hay. Oh. Councillor Hogben. Oh. Councillor Kitchen. Oh. Councillor Landy. Oh. Councillor Lindsay. Councillor Lindsay? Sorry. Four. Thank you. Councillor Milne? Four. Councillor Minto? Four. Councillor Mitchell? Four. Councillor Newman? Four. Councillor Potter? Four. Councillor Ritchie? Four. Councillor Skip? Four. Councillor Vickers? Four. And Councillor Walters? Four. Thank you. That is unanimous four. So it's been approved. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of this evening's meeting. Thank you very much. And see you all next year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Happy Christmas.